I was always always asleep. Oh. They must have heard this one before. Um Mayhew! Mayhew! Mayhew, we're recording one of those one of those sound boxes. Sound oh, sound casts. Oh well uh, uh, Sound casts yeah. uh, Sound cast boy <laughs> Yes, yes, you're trying to find the lever on the back of the chair, I'm aren't you? I can see sorry, yeah, just yeah, sit I'm up, here. sit up, darling. Yeah, I'm sat up, I've sat up. Oh, there we wait, go. is that the right one? Yeah, yeah, probably. Oh god help. Hello. Please don't break my chair. <laughs> I can't help it. Still otherwise in the future you'll be sat in the dog basket. You put me in a chair, I'm gonna break it. Is that how things work? Yeah. You, I mean, you did break my hammer. I've you got, broke my hammer. I've got a weapon of ass destruction. You sat here in the lead up and you went, oh, Chris, I've snapped your thong. I did. And and the thong on, on Mjolnir's base. I love is, fiddling is, with Mjolnir. It's, you uh... do love fiddling with Mjolnir. Do you know what else? You freaked me out the other night. We recorded... Oh, by the way, hi, Big Damn Cast. Hi. You, the other night we recorded an episode and like the next day I'm doing work at my computer... I'm set, up, I'm set up a little green screen studio in the office for a, for a recording thing. Yeah. And suddenly I'm like, the hell? Because freaking my little uh, bumblebee toy that's on the desk on my script pile, my yeah. little script shelf, bumblebee was on the desk. Yeah. And I'd, I hadn't spotted him all night. No. And I come down the morning, I'm like, the hell? Bumblebee's... What the hell? I just, I spend five minutes genuinely just freaking out going how the hell did that get up there then i remembered oh yeah the night before i was recording with the man who can't keep his hands off the transformers it's not even i i I have to do stuff with my hands while i'm doing stuff and they're just there that's why i'm always fiddling with the hammer you know there's well behind behind matt in this room is a is a boxed star scream toy Mm. um and every day we record a podcast after you leave the room i look over at him and there's a bead of sweat on his forehead because he's just like he's just gonna tear me open one day one day you know what? I've already you know, got. I've already got one of those. Well, oh, no, I'm not. I'm not saying you're going to take him. Right. I'm saying you're going to open him and you're yeah. going to transform him, for robot in disguise. It's you quite, know, it's quite a good Star Scream. Do you know I've not opened him yet? Why not? Well, there's two reasons. One, he was originally bought for you. Yes, but then keeps bought with the same thing at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then your good lady had already hey. bought him. I was like, God damn it! Uh, but then I kept him because my I, favorite Star Scream. Well, oh, it's a freaking gorgeous toy as well. But yeah, also, it's good. It's good. I, <laughs> I first told you. About him, I mean, you probably already knew it, but he existed. But I first told I you about him when I went to India in 2017. Because yeah. I went to a place called, it was a Shimla, and it's this like small Victorian town, Victorian style town right. on a mountain range at the foothills of the Himalayas. It's right. where like um, Rudyard Kipling uh, did theatre before everyone said he was shit and he went, Well, I'm going to write then. <laughs> um, and and there was just this, you know, it's a mishmash of different shops, mostly like fabric and food and, you know, a market kind of area. Yes. But then there was this toy shop that was just, you know, bits and pieces, different stuff, mostly aimed at younger kids. You know, the sort of thing you'd see at like an L, uh, 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 ELC or or, yeah. or or in the window of a, of a entertainer or something like that. But slap bang in the middle of it was that. <laughs> There's a freaking, what was it, Transformers uh, Generations. It's Combiner Wars. Combiner Leader Wars. Class Leader Starscream. Class Starscream. Complete with his little movie crown. His little movie crown. And he's just, just there in the middle of the window. I was like, the hell? And I, I took I took a mental note of how much it was. Because I was like, if we get a chance before we leave her, I'm buying that for Matt. Because <laughs> I just I love the idea of, okay, he's Starscream. He's from India. Um, and did you know that he's actually a retool <laughs> of the Generation of Stirling 30 Jetfire? And was also retooled and redecoed into Combiner Wars Leader Class Thundercracker and Skywarp. And this is why you get all the pussy. Yeah. This is why you get all the pussy. Yeah. On my you are, ro- you are gonna, my robo knowledge. You are going to have to feed those pussies at some point. Yeah. Because one packet yeah. of whiskers will not last I think 17 just, different cats. After a while, I just feed them to each other. Oh, well, that is the logic. Yeah, it's cannibalism. In case you're wondering, this episode's filler, <laughs> filler <laughs> night. Uh, you are listening to something recorded in the past. Because... Times, they are changing. Well, technically, you're always into something recorded in the past, because we take at least a couple of days to get it out before we... Yeah, and then when we it. put it back in, we record a podcast. Hey! Well, hey. Uh, um, this is, uh, yeah, this is... Dude, times are tricky around Christmas time, usually for us a lot, so we thought, let's bank one. And why? Why not? 
If it be a filler, dear boy, mm. revisit something topical and timeless at the same time that will not remotely age by the time this goes out, he says, touching wood and then well, slapping a table. Uh, you touch all the wood you like, mate. Mm. Because, mm -hmm. well, there's going to be one glaring omission in this, at least. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe seven. Maybe seven glaring omissions. For all we freaking know at this point. See, many moons ago, sweet boys and girls. Many moons ago. So many years, uh, Back in, I think, actually, back in the um, the black frame days for for SoundCloud and, and Spotify and whatnot, I think we're talking old school... Branding for Big Damn Cast. Oh, I love old school um, branding. Yeah, because I can picture it. The thumbnail had, if I remember correctly, Killmonger in the thumbnail. And oh, it, God, it all some, right. Something like episode 80 something, I think. Point is, many moon, many years ago. 80 something. Many moons back now, sir. <laughs> so within the first two years, we did, around the time of Infinity War or thereafter, a ranking of the MCU villains. Because the common complaint at the time was that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a really entertaining project and we're having a lot of fun with it, but can they do villains? Can they fuck? Like, the villains just sort of aren't memorable in the way that comic book movies of the past always were, except they fucking weren't. There was, like, five with memorable villains in them and that was, like, three Batman movies, four Batman movies. Um, uh, that's it. <laughs> God, how many Batman movies is there now? About uh, seventy-three. No, but think about that. Pre pre the MCU, yeah. what comic book supervillains were like the breakout stars of their movie? Joker. Like I'd yeah I'd argue Jack Nicholson's Joker. Yeah, I'd argue that all four of those Batman movies had a public presence, like the so Joker, Catwoman, Penguin, Riddler, Two Face, and Mister Freeze and Poison Ivy. Like they all had and Bane, bless him. They all, they all had, they all had like a public presence. People know that if you said to someone, um, you know, like oh, the Poison Ivy, mm. someone who's not a comic book fan, you know, watch the cartoons, plays the games, would go, oh, uh, Uma Thurman, in, yeah, in that film, does that pink gorilla striptease? Yeah, it was real hot. It, it was, was real that's hot. Why she took it off. Yeah, and now I'm a, uh, I'm a, a furry who likes to watch people skin themselves. Yeah. It's a very specific very, kink, and really it came weird. from watching her do that. Um, I do other things when I watch that film. I laugh, I cry, and I have a great time. Yeah. Um, but that's it. Like, Gene Hackman's great as Lex Luthor, but he's not the breakout star of any of the Superman movies. No. Um, Who is the breakout star of any of the Superman movies? Chris Reeve. And only Chris Reeve. <laughs> yeah, come on. Like, you, you think of those films, and you think Christopher Reeve being amazing. Uh, and that's... Michael Keener? Is she the breakout star? She's great in them. Mm. But, like, you know, like the, the same way you could argue that Spider-Man 2002 is incredible, but, like, the Green Goblin is not the breakout star. I mean, uh, in, you in could the, argue in, that. You'd in, be wrong. In the public consciousness. You'd be, you'd be wrong about that. In the public consciousness, he's not the breakout star. Whereas Doc Ock... Ouch! You know, am I? Oh, he's a fucking meme queen. He's an absolute legend, but... Doc Ock, for example, was a breakout for number two. And it, it, it was mostly the visual. Like, the way they executed that visual... He was everywhere. He throws a bag of gold coins at Pete. He, he goes and, back and just and before that, bags full of gold coins. He's wearing a slightly bigger coat than he was in a previous scene, and he's got a hat on, and that'll disguise him. It is like a sixties comic book, isn't it? I love it, and I love Raimi's sensibility in those films. But anyway, but like Doc Ock was breakout. He was on. He was on posters everywhere. He was in a lot of the marketing for that movie. Like Doc Ock stood out. You know what I mean? That th With they, all eight of his legs. Yeah. It, th would that they could, Sony would have made sure that Venom was, like, the thing from number three. They tried. Well, they, they got as close as they were allowed to for story reasons, which yeah. is, let's show Spider-Man in his black costume a lot. So, but yes, yeah, so there's not really any villains that, like, you know, Shredder is really imposing and freaky in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Not the breakout star of that film by any stretch of the imagination. No, it's, it's Casey Jones, obviously. <laughs> no, but... Big up Casey Jones. Um, <clears throat> but you know what I'm getting at, right? Yeah. So the, the MCU sort of... I know it, what you're it, getting it, at, it isn't, we should get there quicker. It isn't an unusual... <laughs> <laughs> it, 
it isn't an unusual circumstance. It, is, it isn't an unusual thing for for like the villain to not be the thing that stands out. It's yeah. Batman films kind of made everyone think that's how it's meant to be. But you ask Joe Joe Public on the street, who's the bad guy in Batman Begins? They'll have no fucking clue. I don't know if it's Joe Public though. It might be Joe Davis. Could be Joe Fix It. Could be Joe Fix It. But to be fair, you recognise him. Could be Joe Mama. It's about ten. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note hey uh, my name is uh well, you've, you've used the green goblin now so yeah <laughs> my name is chris you can't do this to me johnson <laughs> and i am going back to formula we are ranking from scratch once again with new additions, because there have been at least one two three four five six seven eight official ones since we last did this eight official eight official the mcu marvel cinematic universe villains now there are some rules so if you want to play along at home as you listen you got to stick by them you little shits but first before we do anything else none of this matters our opinions are our opinions if you get angry at it we do think you're a loser yeah and you will not get a date to prom so not with me no, definitely. And I am the most eligible bachelor. I'm not. I'm neither a bachelor nor eligible. No, but you are Mr. Irresistible. I am Mr. Ir- Mr. Irresistible is here to take you to the prom. <laughs> so if someone were to take you to prom, it'd be like when someone asks a celebrity out. To yeah, prom. yeah. So, so I think it's fair. I think it's fair. You know, only you, Mr. Irresistible will bring you a corsage you, yeah. and pick you up at eight. Oh damn, Mr. Irresistible! <laughs> um, and that, yeah, and you're not even you're not even going to go to any bases. But you're going to take some really cool pictures and one day they'll have a great story where they're like, I took Mr. Irresistible to prom. You did. And he taught me a lesson I'll never forget. And then he went to prison. Uh, <laughs> anyway. I said, no bases. No bases. <laughs> not getting to any um, base. <laughs> you will glance at first base and that is it. It's first, base holding, first. It's first base holding hands. First base is knees. Touching knees under the table. It's a head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, head, shoulders, shoulders knees, knees, and knees and toes, knees and toes, and ears, and ears, and, 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 and Oh, no, no. Right. <laughs> um, so, here are the rules. Uh, they have to be considered the main threat within the movie that they're in. They've got to be either the clear antagonist, mm. or, and we'll mention it case by case if, if we need to, uh, they have to be the one who is the most prominent for mm. example that will look forward for the winter soldier the captain american the winter soldier the antagonist as far as we're concerned is the winter soldier as far as you're concerned i, I know you well alexander pierce is the villain but alexander pierce is not the title character he's not the title character he's not a prominent threat throughout the movie and he's what i'd like to call the disney twist villain listen i would like to say before we go any further that mm-hmm. any decisions you don't like in this podcast are chris's and any decisions you do like in this <laughs> podcast are mine because mine are always right and chris's are always wrong mine are always left um so uh also up top Something changed in the hierarchy of the MCU that has affected this list compared to the last one. The last one, two of our top three villains were from the Netflix shows. These shows, as well as the ABC series and things like Runaways and Cloak and Dagger, like they, you know, most wanted, they now no longer count towards the ranking. How, how could we, how... (laughs) Could we discount Hellstrom? Oh fuck! Of course, Hellstrom. Mad, isn't it? Um, but that's the thing it, that that complicates Sad, it because also with them being <laughs> with them being full on series, yeah, they have multiple villains. Yeah. Yes, there are arcs like we've got. Um, shit, what's his name? Noah. No, wait, Noah. <laughs> no, you. <bastard. laughs> um, oh my god, I'm having a moment. Aliens. Um, uh, game over, man. Game over. Bill Paxton. Bill Paxton. Thank you. Bill Paxton, for example, is sort of like the antagonist representing the Hydra side of stuff in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. series. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that's like, it's it's still a reveal over the course of the series. And if you if you were looking at those TV series, you'd have people going, well, what about Absorbing Man? He's in series two. What about you know, Faustus? He's in Agent Carter and all that. And it's like, look, can't do that. It's going to take a million years. The Netflix shows are clearer because there seems to be a primary antagonist within each arc. Mm. And we did count them last time as far as they were up to at that point. But unfortunately, it does mean we're going to have to leave out, you know, like Black Mariah and whoever the fuck the bad guy was in Iron Fist, etc., etc. And like, 
It sucks because two of the best villains the MCU has produced so far are Kingpin, played by Vincent D'Onofrio, as well as some Fisk. Yeah. And Kilgrave, Zebediah Kilgrave, played by David Tennant and Jessica Jones, the Purple Man. They are hands down two of the best villains that the MCU has brought up. It's true. But <laughs> the times they have been are changing. And so who cares? The legitimacy of whether they exist or not in this continuity anymore is currently, as of this recording, in early November, completely up in the air. Yeah. So we have to put them on the back burner. But know this, Big Willy. Know this, uh, Creepy what? Purple Boy. If you counted, I think you'd absolutely be making it into the top ten, without a doubt. But you don't, so fuck off. Also, <laughs> as of this recording, we have not seen The Eternals. No, we're recording this two days before The Eternals comes out. The day before The Eternals comes out in the UK. But we assume that Crow is the greatest villain ever, and everybody else can go suck a fuck. They can go eat Crow. That they, they, Yes, they can. For those listening um, at home, I stood up like Citizen Kane. Uh, um, <laughs> ah, like Citizen Kane in the movie. Citizen, Citizen Kane. Kane. <laughs> I thought you were going to go, ah, like Citizen Kane from my movie, The Creeping the, Kid. The Creeping Kid. <laughs> the Citizen Kane. Um, um, and also, uh, by the time of this recording, uh, Spider-Man No Way Home is not out. Um, we still don't know who the villain is in Spider-Man No Way Home. The at this villain. Point. At the speculation at the moment points toward the villain being the Green Goblin, but... Sure, we'll, just, we'll see. We'll see. We shall. We'll see at some point in December. Is it? Yes, but uh, they're still doing. They're still finishing a lot of the visual effects. So I wouldn't be surprised if. Oh, due to they're COVID not, reasons, we're going gonna to postpone it. it. Well, yeah, I don't think they will because of Morbius. I think Morbius, Morbius being scheduled for January is a yeah. sign that Spider Man's on track. Because they want Morbius to ride the wave of Venom 2 and Spider-Man 3. I have a feeling Morbius is going to ride the wave of my vomit down the drain. But hey, we'll see. We'll see. We haven't uh, seen it yet. It could Jar- be a masterpiece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. But it's also starring Jared <laughs> Cult Island DMs his underage fans. Allegedly, Leto. Yeah, uh, well, Leto Judley. Let's you. not hold the sex quest against it, eh? Um, let's not hold anything against the sex quest. No, that's true. Instead, let us rank... The MCU villains! We're going on a five-star system. So we're going five on stars! One out of five. And then when we narrow it down to whoever's like competing or going neck and neck, if there isn't a clear winner, mm. we'll have a little chinwag about them and make All the right. decision. All right. So first up, going chronological, like a 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 Lee. For Iron Man, the villain we have chosen is Obadiah Stane, the Iron Monger. Played by Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges <laughs> and Jeff Bridges. Beard. Tony Stark ranked this list in a cave with a box of scraps. And for that alone, he gets three stars. Well, here's the thing. Obadiah is a great antagonist for that movie. It's a really fun performance from Bridges. But Obadiah, Obadiah, Obadiah. But behind the scenes since has kind of illuminated even more weirdness around it. Uh, there was a script for Iron Man. But certain Was scenes, it? yeah. But certain I scenes, wouldn't have noticed. Certain scenes were really loose <laughs> because they were encouraging improv on the day. Yeah. Like early on in the in test screenings and whatnot, they realised that Downey Jr. and and um, Gwyneth Paltrow in particular had great rapport mm. and were able to improvise, <laughs> improvise really well around one another and, and just come up with shit on the spot. It wasn't so much great rapport as it was the quiet, loud dynamic of a Nirvana song in dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> Look, when she pops her moon egg up her hoo-ha, ah! she can do anything. Now, buy a candle that smells like her folds. <laughs> um, ah! For those listening along at home wondering what the fuck, look up goop. Uh, oh, so don't look up goop. Don't look up goop. Fuck your Google ads, doesn't it? Oh, God, yeah. Gwyneth Paltrow is... Problematic. Yeah, she's a, she's, a, she's a fine actor. She's a damn fine actor, but good Lord, what is a she? weird industrialist. I've, I've never not liked her in something. I've always liked her in stuff. Hmm... <laughs> Moving swiftly on. Yeah. Um, so Jeff Bridges has, has gone on to say that he is not sort of an improv guy by trade. So it was really disarming to him and it took him a long time to get used to the freedom of improv on this film. I don't think it shows. That's what I'm going to say. He he holds his own. He's, and he, Bridges, he's mostly, yeah. for the first half of the movie, he's mostly just playing a straight man role to Downey Jr. Yeah. That's kind of what he's there to do. The second half is where the plot lets him kind of add some more layer to that, which is just, oh, it's not just your dad's best mate who's trying to help you run the company. This guy's 
planned your death. Like, you were meant to die in Act 1 because he organised it. He has planned your death! And uh, that is, you know, that's... We get to see his villainous side creep out, like the scene where he sort of paralyses him and basically is just like, yeah, you're going to die and I'm going to do this. Bye! Is played completely Bye. scary. Like, by that point, you feel like Tony is invincible. He's built himself back up. And he's on top of the goddamn world, and then this creepy bastard shows up and is like, yeah, you are going to die now, and I'm going to fuck off and take your company. Yeah. Bye. So it, it it's definitely a nice sort of, oh no, well, he's got the upper hand, but also um, we get like one fight, so as a, as a villain, yeah. we don't really get to see him... He doesn't... He do- as a super villain, we don't really get to see him do much. Yeah, he can't match Tony in ingenuity and ultimately you can't match him in a fight because mm. even though he's got the bigger guns he didn't put he's not he, freaking he, heating pads he in his guns he I guess he didn't solve the icing problem yeah <laughs> just didn't solve the also icing he problem. didn't build his own suit he got us to build it for him yeah because Obadiah Stane is ultimately a schmuck yeah yeah he's 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 he's, he's, he's smart but he gets other people to do the work for him. I'm going to say three stars for Obi, mainly I'm on the three. strength of Jeff Bridges' performance. Do you know what? I think it's solid middle ground. Yeah, because you're meant to like him and trust yeah, him yeah, for the first yeah. half, and but you definitely do. Because well. it's Jeff Bridges. He's got a wonderful warm to him. I've heard he has. Well, so for that reason, boys and girls, we're going to elect three stars for Yefri Bridgei. Yefri Bridgei. Milk. All right. That was loud. Sorry, everyone. Uh, do you know what else is loud? Um, the apocalypse? I don't know what. The segue doesn't work. Uh, the Incredible Hulk, who our antagonist well, there are is... There cannons in it, but you can't hear them because they're hypersonic. Good God. Or now, subsonic. Now, General, as he is at that point, Thaddeus Ross is sort of our, you know, antagonistic oh, yeah. force. Good old Tad. But our villain is Emil Blonsky. Yeah. Played by Tim Roth, the, uh, the soldier who after some sort of experimentation similar to what happened to Banner in a more controlled environment, is the sort of the next guy to undergo the modern take on the super soldier experiment yeah. in Captain America, which results in him becoming an abomination. It goes terribly a big old wrong. bony, scary man. Um, I think Blonsky fares better as an interesting visual and villain and physical threat uh, for a few reasons over Obadiah, because Blonsky... Goes toe to toe with the Hulk twice. Yeah, the Hulk, not the Playboy in the suit of oh, armor. That being said, the f- goddamn Hulk. The first time he does that, he gets left in fucking traction. When he's when he's beaten, yeah. But there's a good few minutes where he's just jumping around him and getting licks in, mm. which makes for a really entertaining fight as well at first. Because you're like, there's this tiny dude just like jumping around and punching him in the face. This is great. And it was the first time we'd seen that. Yeah. As well, which is like, this is really cool. No Hulk dogs in this film. No, <laughs> no fucking Hulk dogs or comic panels or or, or daddy issue it stories. Weird, wasn't it? It weird. Yeah, I admire what Ang Lee was going for. Do I think the execution's awful. Do you? Do you admire it? I do. You shouldn't. I do. Should you? No. Okay. Uh, you know, the tie-in comic for that was illustrated by Mark Bagley. That's how I revisited that film after seeing wow. it. Wow. I read the comic a lot. And, and the comic obviously does that thing that a lot of the novelizations do, which is it distills it to the the basics based on the original draft. I mean, you want to talk about misrepresentation. That's... Uh... Yeah. It's like, it, it was a beautifully illustrated comic adaptation of a fucking weird movie. But The Incredible Hulk's not a bad film. It's, it's you know, it's sort of forgotten a bit because it's, it's not all that. But Blonsky's an interesting character. So interesting, in fact, that we've seen him cameo since in Shang-Chi and he's coming back in She-Hulk next year. I'm going to say two stars because we don't see him hang dick. Yeah, I'm not going to accept like that a, as a reasoning. Like a Kendall. I'm not going to ex- accept that for a reasoning. We, he might have he might have grown a gamma dick since because last time we saw him in Shang Chi, he had a uh, yeah, one clock on. Yeah, so maybe he does hang dong now. Maybe he does hang dong because um, his mutation now is looking more like the comic book one, but yeah, more scaly fins, and finny. Yeah. Whereas in this, of course, when he mutates, he's like a he's like the human skeleton and muscle systems trying to burst out of a human body. Yeah, with a green tinge and big old thick with three C's legs. They all think he's got mass- he's got tree trunk legs. It's really weird. No, I do like Blonsky. I, 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 I like a Hulk sized villain who yeah. talks shit. Yeah, he does talk shit. Like, like he's, he's just taunting him in, in the last fight, and and I, I, you know, he holds his own. 
but for me, the strength of it as a because again, we're rank, ranking this based on like how effective they are in the movie, but also just how much we enjoy watching them. Yes, I, I it's it's like Obadiah. It's Roth's performance is what makes him stand out. Yes, and I think Roth's performance is strong enough to make this at least a three. Yes, I'll go with that. How you feeling, soldier? Pissed off and ready for round two, sir. So I'm greasy. I'm a greasy little man. Oh no! Greasy. Well, you don't know what you're doing, do you? What, you just... don't know how sheets works. On Excel? On Excel, sir. What are you doing? I don't know. Okay, now what's happening? Why don't you do it, you bastard? Right, you just click on the cell, yeah? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Tab. Big man on campus. Tab it, Tab it. All right. There we go. <laughs> so we're at zero. Does that, does that affect it less? There we go. There we, there we go. are. Hey. I can tell you work with stock it, and you actual put, human you intelligence. Put a, you put an operator in there. It's gonna Oper- operator operator operator. It, it's gonna expect a fucking um, equation. Unit. Ah, so you put NA if you weren't. I just wrote basically. I wrote a, a fucking put dash a number in, there in in the column because we use it Excel so we can keep track of it visually. You put a value in there. You're all right. You put an operator in there. It's I don't like, put value in anything. It's like, mm. So um, yeah, because if you do, it'll get taken away from you, and then you'll have to go after the billionaire who ruined your family in some sort of weird vengeance crusade. Um, lose your favourite bird, gain a different bird, build a suit with uh, lightning tentacles, and then lose that suit, and then build a bigger suit with bigger lightning tentacles, <laughs> as well as a bunch of drones, but then ultimately get chumped by the object of your hatred and his best mate. So like Ivan Vanko from like Ivan Iron Vanko, Man 2. Whiplash in Iron Man 2. Um, Whip- this is an odd one, because like Obadiah Stain, a little bit, but more so in this case, um... Mickey Rock's character in Iron Man 2 is a is a hodgepodge amalgamation of two Iron Man villains, which seems to be a recurring thing for Iron Man villains. They sort of get yeah. merged together. Like, Obadiah Stane none is... none of them particularly interesting on their own, really. Well, hey, who's the cold guy? Blizzard. <laughs> you don't you talk shit about the living laser. <gasps> I love living laser. Radioactive man. The melter. The melter! The unicorn! Okay, yeah, now you're saying these things out loud, I'm like... Uh, no wonder the this porcupine. Fucking... They basically looked at a list of Iron Man's villains and they went, "Whose name doesn't sound the dumbest?" Christopher the porcupine. Iron Monger. Right, we'll do that. We'll create Iron Monger. And uh, who's that guy? Obadiah Stane. We'll just kind of, we'll just kind of put them together, I guess, because Obadiah Stane has been Iron Monger, hasn't he? But like, there's other bit. There's been other Iron Mongers as well. So Probably. like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dwindling profession, but it's still out there. <laughs> oh God. One so, does uh, need to mong iron. Terrible. So Whiplash is. Visually Whiplash, um, and in backstory is Whiplash. more so the Crimson Dynamo. Yeah. Um, which is fun, because obviously later on there's a throwaway joke where Yelena refers to um, uh, uh, bloody Alexi as... Um, the Crimson Dynamo. The Crimson Dynamo and Black Widow, implying that there has been a Crimson Dynamo. But we're not talking about Alexi, we're talking about... Whiplash. Well, that's I'm, what I'm saying. I'm villain is Whiplash. Well, that's what I'm saying. They've got room to play with that concept separately because I'm this guy is Whiplash, a... though. Here's the thing. Visually, the electric whips is pretty fucking cool. Yeah. They... Like, it shouldn't be, yeah. but then you have the scene at... at um, the racetrack. The racetrack it's where he's really just, good. like, yeah, yeah. tearing through vehicles and you're like, yeah, if one of those whips gets, like, grabs you or hits you, you're probably fucked. Oh, yeah, you're in pieces. So that's... Scary. And then the upgraded armour version's a bit bland at the end, but he keeps the whips. So... I think that's the problem with Whiplash in general. It's just a bit bland. For all the stuff that they're trying to do by, you know, casting Mickey Rourke and giving him a funny accent and covering him in tattoos... He wants his bird. He wants his bird, but he doesn't... That is not his bird. It's not his bird. <laughs> I, I, it... Look, he takes his boots off! Oh, that's funny. Here's the thing. It's two, in it. It's a two. Yeah, but it's a strong two for me, because visuals are fun... And Rourke's performance is really fun. There's just not enough of it. But there's not enough of it. Exactly. And also the fact that he's... He's dead, isn't he? I was going to say, is he still out there? He's dead. It it feels very emblematic of Tony Stark's legacy going forward. Like, he... This is a villain he didn't create. No. But this is a villain who is created because of Tony's life and circumstances. Yeah. And instead of Tony being like, look... There's a very brief moment where they talk to each other in the holding cell. Where he's just like, you know... Throw me a bone here. What, what do you want me to do? What do you want? You know what I mean? Like, how can I help? And think he's not fussing the Tony's just like, all right, fuck you then, bye. And it's like, oh, that kind of sucks. Like, oh, now you are creating a villain. Yeah. Which is well, why... Which is why I've already done that anyway, but... Well, he didn't create 
Whiplash. Not intentionally. Exactly. Exactly. It's it, The pattern starts here. Where, like, yeah. suddenly it becomes fashion for Tony to actions to lead to these horrible people oh, um yeah. obviously yeah. here it's a it's a thing of opportunity for the other villain of the movie justin hammer who doesn't count because sam rockwell's fucking excellent but you know he's ultimately the the money man who flounces and is camp as christmas and absolutely brilliant but he's not the antagonist of the film he's i call not. it the ex-wife oh, God. it's not a great joke is it it's not a great it's joke a joke but but you believe you believe the pettiness of it because I, I, I believe it's the kind of thing Justin Hammer would say. Yeah, exactly. So you got shit. It, it's like, what's that even fucking mean, dude? Like, what are you? Yeah. Oh, but yeah. Um, it's a guy I, who's I, never been at the gym trying to do locker room talk. I think that's a locker room talk. Yeah, I think exactly. that's. I think that's another thing that knocks a point down for Whiplash is that he shares the stage with Hammer, who is just ultimately a more charismatic presence. Which, when you're up against Mickey Rourke, he's saying something. Yeah, and this is Mickey Rourke at the height of his fucking comeback yeah. powers as well. So, uh, Whiplash gets a big old stinky two out of five. Two. Now, the next villain is technically the villain of two movies in this phase, and there's an ongoing threat going yes, forward, yes, so yes, we're yes, going to yes. just count him as his own thing. Loki, Tom Hiddleston. In Thor and L'Avengeur. L'Avengeur. And um, minor antagonist in Thor Ragnarok. Man and antagonist. Thor the Dark World. And partially also in his own show, kind of. Um, we're not going to be counting the Loki of Loki. Because that ain't this Loki. It, although it is also this Loki. It is this Loki up to the point we've got him in the list. It is this Loki. But it ain't the character over... Like he ain't a super, By the time of Loki, he's not a supervillain anymore, is what no. I'm getting at. Um, well, Loki's great. Um, Loki. Four stars. Moving on. That was terrible. Say words about the man. No, so words about the man. Um, He's a good man. I don't. I think if it would, ju- if we were judging it solely off of the movie Thor, probably wouldn't rank as high. No, Hiddleston's doing some great no. work in that, but it's just very kind of. Like Br- Thor's Br- fun. Branagh was the Br- Branagh was a great choice of director for that movie. Yeah, I think you needed a different script tonally to bring out yeah. something other than isn't this dramatic and faux Shakespearean yes and and that's kind of a shame because that first Thor suffers a bit on rewatch now Thor's fun but it is all set up yeah it's all set up yeah Um, and so the Loki of Thor is just being set up for Avengers Loki where he's leaner and hungrier and he's been through some shit and he's got a mean streak. He's got a meaner streak. I mean, look at because the in Thor, you the audience have no idea where his actual plan is going. No, in a way that I think they thought was clever. Yeah, but it just feels a little disjointed. Like when he when he kills Laufey, as Laufey's like about to kill Odin while he's in the Odin sleep. Like you sort of go, wait, hang on, you set it up for him to be. Who are you loyal to? And then of course the whole thing of like Odin, like he lied to me. Mm. Like well then hang on, who are you? What? Like, well, it's a power grab, isn't your, it? Your, your, your issue isn't with your brother. Like The film has established at this point that the two of you are as thick as fucking thieves. So why are you throwing him under the bus so much? Now, obviously, his nature, as we as we learned yeah. throughout the films, it is really about like power and feeling like he's he was always deserving of something he yeah. figures out to be better. But I think in that first film, it doesn't quite get that across properly i think it makes more sense as you go as you go back and look at it because it does become this thing of it's not that he's wanting to so they take the odin example he mm. doesn't want to kill odin he wants to have power over odin and by mm. saving by setting it up yeah so that he can save odin he then has power over him so when odin wakes up he's like oh yes my other son's a dick and yeah he's elsewhere and yeah. you saved my life and yeah it's not that his, his, his plots aren't as simple as just like oh let's kill the people <laughs> who are in my way it's let's manipulate people so i don't have to kill the people who are in my way they just own me stuff and then as soon as he can get to make the switch mm. like he does in thought the dark world he does yeah yeah, that's true. He's sort of laying groundwork for plans upon plans upon yeah, plans, yeah. But which does, I think but, is what makes kind of what makes him so compelling. But does that come out of nowhere? Considering in Thor, he sort of in Act One learns about what's been kept from him, and then suddenly has this multi-layered plan, like out of within not even days. It's within like moments. No, because you already like, know he's a schemer. True. And true. he's a god of mischief. He's the god of mischief. You can do mischief. If you can do mischief, you don't just do it it's on like, the off. You have like, to plan it. It's like being a slither, isn't it? It's like being told, oh, you're this. Like, you're the god of mischief. He's is like, he, oh, yeah. well, I guess I'll have to well, do that is then. He, is he like that? <laughs> is he like that 
because he's the god of mischief or is he the god of mischief because he's like that? Is the question. Mm, good point. I think Loki's one of the more rounded villain characters to the point where he's kind of come full circle into being not a villain, more of an anti-hero. Um, I mean, his peak villainy is in Avengers. Is Avengers, Which yeah. is why we, we sort of combine the two. And I think it's that, that defeat and that humility that sows the seeds for his later sort of reformation. Um, in both versions of Loki, in the Loki who dies in Infinity War and the, and the variant Loki who survives the event through that and mm-hmm. into the events of Loki. So I, I think that he's got the most character development. And I'm going to put Loki at a five. Yeah. I'm going to put Loki at a five. I mean, even, I'd, I'd happily give him the five just for that fucking shit-eating grin on his face when he appears at the start yeah, of Avengers. Yeah. So he just like the Tesseract does its thing and he appears through this, you know, the space portal and just looks up and it's like, fucking hell. He looks like he's been through some shit, but he also looks really happy to be here for some reason. If it's all the same to you, I think I'll take that drink now. Exactly. Oh, again, in that film, he's a great villain. He holds it in a film that is all about a lot of personalities being brought together. Yeah. Where the villain could very easily be background noise to facilitate the heroes. In that movie, he is absolutely every bit as much a star as the main characters are. And the great thing that they've done is that every time they've used him again, they've added layers to that character, mm. which makes all his previous actions, it puts new context into them. Uh, which I think is a really great way to, you know, considering this is a, a massive franchise. It's with, a big old soap opera. Yeah. It keeps going. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. I, you know, I agree. Let's, do, let's, give, let's give Loki a five. Give him a goddamn five. Oh! Give that man a yes. Yoska! Um, right, next one. This is one of Marvel's biggest, sort of most notorious villains, but I'm not sure he's going to fare that well here, considering he kind of is one and done, really. He, we see him since, but he's, this he's is one it, and done. really. He's a bit one note. He's very visually effective. Oh, he's very visually effective. And, um, and for the tone of that film... Yes, absolutely ...is works. fucking perfect. Uh, we're talking, of course, about Hugo Weaving as Johann Schmidt... Slash... The Red Skull. Yeah. Um... um Red uh, Captain America. First off, Captain America: The First Avenger is a fucking perfect superhero movie. Yeah, like it's it's just it's just great. It is so so good. It's it's the most self contained kind of. If you said to someone like, if someone was like, I've not watched any of the Marvel films. Mm. I, I don't really want to get into it, but like, would you show me one of them? Mm. I'd go, yeah, fucking spin Captain America: The First Avenger. Let's go, boys. Mm. Let's go because you know if they have a good time, they'll go. So that ending bit is he like? Yeah. In the future, like, well. Oh, funny you should say that and then you know if they want to see more they can see more but well, also it's it's there's a reason that you get the director of the Rocketeer yeah to come in and make a film that feels like some kind of spiritual successor to the Rocketeer yeah um, you have an incredible cast uh, you know uh, Stanley Tucci Tommy Lee Jones Hayley Atwell uh, Sebastian Stan and absolutely of course head and shoulders above everybody Toby Jones. Toby um, Jones. Oh, but, but slightly, slightly, slight, only slightly taller than Toby Jones because Toby Jones is a fucking big hench boy. Slightly yes. taller than him is uh, Chris Evans, obviously, who's Cre- a fucking phenomenally. Evans. And in that film, immediately made you go, oh, they're going to make Captain America work. Yeah. This works. Wait, I think... they've not compromised him. They've, they've lent into the earnestness and it works because they cast him perfectly. Okay, bring it on. Like, it, it, it works so well. And you need for that bastion of genuinely, that bastion of, of, of genuine, like, heroism and right and goodness, you needed a villain that mirrored it perfectly in this. Yeah. And I think Hugo Weaving does a fantastic fucking job. However, in I think that's what, it, that's what it suffers from because he's not necessarily allowed to have as much development as some of the other villains because he's there mm. as a foil to Captain America and his only purpose is to provide that antagonistic force which sounds like a weird criticism considering that he is an antagonist and you know conflict and drama and all that kind of stuff but it no, just no, you means... mean he's 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 a he's a he's one of those villains we were talking about before where they're not a breakout they're no. there to help the story function yeah hugo even does a great job with what little he is given to flex with i think the choice of giving johan schmidt uh an artificial mask over his red face yeah was a really good choice because he he gets to use like his expressions, micro expressions, his his eyes mm. a lot in those scenes where he's confronted by superior officers or where he's pursuing the occult stuff and the tesseract and everything. You can really, 
and I also lo- I also love that lovely um the, the subtlety of that in the opening of this where like him finding it they link it to the the world tree yeah and, and the nine realms and you sort of go oh like in that film we saw two months ago it's yeah like, it's it's such a nice little like yeah introduction to the idea that all these films are going to start to snowball into one another um but like he he gets to really play the hunger uh, and the drive without the dialogue allowing for that um you can see it in his face however it is slightly colored in retrospect by hugo weaving's pissiness over the whole experience the fact that he hated making it yeah yeah is is uh and and f- seemingly just for the fact well two reasons based on what he said one he's sick of blockbusters so he wanted to, he just hates the fact that they're they're very you know abc and it's like old man yells at cloud isn't it? yeah well that's here's the thing dude like you get a kid into movies like through something that's just entertaining and fun and has a good message and is well made that kid might then want to go and check out the more elaborate or nuanced stuff. Like yeah. that's you know you, you can't just throw a fucking art house film in front of a child and go like cinema. This is cinema. Yeah, you've got to you, you come on. Blockbusters absolutely have their place. Yeah. And the other reason being the prosthetics, he fucking hated it and never wanted to do it again. Which is why, of course, when the Red Skull shows up twice in live action after this uh, on on Vormir, he's played by Ross Marquand. With subtle prosthetics and motion tracking, yeah. <laughs> so he's not even wearing a full thing. Oh, you go! You could have picked up an easy paycheck for those two movies and then been in two of the biggest movies financially of all time. But sure, whatever, Trev. No, go off, sis. So, um, um, I think he's a three. I'd say four. You go for a four. I say four. Ooh, why would you go four? Because why, it is such a push? strong performance. It is a bit pared down, but it is a very strong performance. I just spat then. Should we rock, weird. paper, scissors for it? Yeah. Yeah. Because okay. I, I don't know if I could go four. I think I'd have to go three. So we'll go right. So I'm gonna, are, we, are we doing this? One, one two, two reveal. Three. No, one, two, three, reveal. Okay, so one, two, so. three, four. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. One, <laughs> two, three, bah. Oh, rock, rock to scissors. scissors. So yeah, it's a three. He's a three. It's a three for old... Um, for Johann old Johan Schmidt. Uh, so we move to phase two, and I think this is going to be real fucking easy. Yeah. Iron Man 3's antagonist is Aldrich Killian, played by Guy Pearce. Is it two? Next. I wouldn't even go so far as two. And I'll tell you for why. All right, okay. Tell I'll me tell you for why. Iron Man 3 is a, is a character piece about Tony. Yeah. The villains completely take take a back seat. Yeah. Um, the threat and the action and the excitement comes from the extremist virus and from the people infected by it, the people who use it, the, the extremist infused henchmen and henchwomen. Like, they are kind of the excitement yeah, the of the film. Stuff, yeah. As well as, obviously, one of them using the Iron Patriot armor. Like, yeah. that stuff on the plane is really scary. Um, the Mandarin, obviously, is a false front, so it was never going to be in, in the thingy, but Kingsley's performance is... That's the villainous intrigue that was the signature of the movie and the breakout star of it. Especially in the marketing, people were like, oh my God, he's terrifying. Like This yeah. is really scary because it was yeah. mirroring real world shit that we're all still dealing with. Not as much at the moment as we were 10, 15 years ago, but so, still it's all fresh in the mind. Yeah. And um, Killian is the Walt Disney frozen surprise villain. Like, yeah. That's yeah. what he is. You know he's got something to do with it as the film goes on. Any comic book reader worth the salt is going, wait, he runs AIM? Yeah. Wait, he's named after that guy from the Extremist storyline. He's not really that much of a villain. He's in it for like, like one page. And, and you know he's yeah. part of why everything happens. So you're like, he's going to be a baddie probably. Um, and he is a threat in the final fight against Tony, which the two of them fighting. And, and Aldrich's got the Extremist virus. I'm not taking away points because of the, you want the Mandarin? I am the Mandarin. Because... I've, I am. Well, for me, it's never been him going, I'm the Mandarin. The Mandarin's an idea. It's a fucking false front. So him saying that is like, you want a villain to punch? It's me. Like, I'm behind all this, you bastard. So I never took it as, I'm the Mandarin. The reason it feels like that is because they give him a fucking giant Chinese dragon tattoo. Yeah, that's, that's not cool. And it's kind of weird. Um, I just, and I think Guy Pearce is a really good performer. I love him in loads of other films Love as well. Guy Pearce. He's in a lot of shit, though. I just think Aldrich is kind of, a, he's kind of a nothing in the grand scheme. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Like he's with you. he's this film is about Tony and about Pepper and not Aldrich Killian at all. No, he's the salt. You could take him out of this. Bastard. You could take Aldrich Killian out of this, replace him with any other sort of yeah, villain he's of a similar tier. Isn't it? So I think it's a one. It's a one. I, I just you know he's 
Again, that's not that we're not saying it's shit. Everyone who's casting these movies is casting them because they're good, but you know. Case in point, Christopher Eccleston as Malachi. It's a one. It's a one because he doesn't one. do anything with him. He's my boy. He's a great fucking actor and do nothing with him. So since doing conventions, Christopher Eccleston has talked openly about doing Thor the Dark World, and he said the reason he did it was twofold. Uh one, he thought it'd be fun. And two he was like he's had his second kid at that point. Yeah, like he's 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 a dad. He had a fucking payday, baby. He hadn't had a payday in a while. Yeah, he wanted some money, so he was offered this. He wanted to work with the director, Alan Taylor. Alan Taylor. Well, it, would he, would who, who he has nothing but good things to say about working would, on the would, movie. He, but he I'm like, cast in it when Patty Jenkins was on it, wouldn't he? Uh, he might have been cast when Patty Jenkins was on it, but he talks a lot about working with Alan Taylor oh, okay, and having cool. a good time working with him. Cool. But um, but yeah, he he was told it would be some prosthetics. Uh, what he was not told was it would be six hours of prosthetics every morning. For nothing. For nothing. Like for for, for barely any be. scenes where he speaks English, so he doesn't get to bounce off of the other actors. It's a lot of standing around looking intimidating. And in his own words, it could have been anyone in that part. He said anyone could have played that. Which is not like a thing on, you know, oh yeah, no, it, it's open to interpretation. He's just saying like, look at, look at the finished product. Yeah. Could have been fucking anybody that. Like, I there was nothing I brought to that. Because he also says that it's not entirely everyone else. Like, it's him, too. He didn't do anything unique. Yeah. But he also was working in the parameters he was given. Yeah. And he wasn't able to bring anything out of it. Now, maybe another actor, given this really minimal, like, you know, sort of kind of poor basic role yeah. as Malekith was in that movie... Another actor might have been able to use those parameters and do something kind of special with it, but it wasn't him. Yeah. And, and you know, he, he said that... Someone said, would you ever come back as a different character? And he said, I'm, I'm never saying never, but I'd never do that again. Yeah. And it's like, okay. So, basically, MCU, if you want to hire Chris Eccleston again, don't waste him. Give him something to do. Give him something fucking tasty don't, to do. Don't waste him on a one-star villain. Yeah, he definitely gets one star too, yeah. just based off the fact that Malekith in the comics is ten times more interesting yeah, and just, fun. Yeah, don't know what, got all this great Malekith material, they fuck all he's like, with he's, it. He's, he's, a fucking, he's like Loki on steroids. Yeah. He's, a, he's, a, he's a sadist. He's a fucking... He's, he's the Joker, but an elf. Like, he's terrifying. And then this is just... Raw, 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 raw. There were a lot of poor decisions made in the Dark World. The design of Curse was not one of them. That, yeah, that's Curse true. looked fucking excellent. We're not talking about Curse. No, we're he's talking not about the one. Winter Soldier. Right, you've got you've got point of uh, conjecture on this, haven't you? Yeah, you've got a you've got a, you've got a bone to pick for the the film Captain America and the Winter Soldier, which is still, as far as I'm concerned, the best MCU movie. But anyway, yeah, I'll not argue that. Um, <laughs> it's all the president's men with punching. It is all the president's men, <laughs> and in that sense, Alexander <laughs> Pierce is your fucking villain. Because he's pulling all the strings and he does the great sort of I'm charming, 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 charming and then villain, I'm in control of everything switch. Whereas I will give this to Winter Soldier. He's very threatening. Mm-hmm. Like all the action scenes with him are very intimidating. The knife and he catch. Does, the fucking yeah. knife catch, man. He does really give... That's real. That's fucking real. It's he, not CGI. He gives a really great physical threat to both Black Widow and Cap which is, you know an achievement in and of itself. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Big fan of that. But, I don't... Do you want to know why I've picked the Winter Soldier? Yeah, why do you pick the Winter Soldier? I was played by Sebastian Stan over Alexander Pierce. I was played yes. by Robert Redford. Yeah. Um, Alexander Pierce isn't a supervillain. He's disturbingly real. Okay. We, we we live in a world, and obviously like, I'm not saying heads of security forces and stuff are fucking around on this scale. They might be. We'll never know. But mm. like, Alexander Pierce is reminiscent of every corrupt politician, every, um, every bent CEO, every billionaire who could do many different things to change the world for the better, but decides to go about a different route, which he sees as the ultimate good. Yeah. In this film, of course, being... We are programming three helicarriers to kill people of interest that we perceive as a threat. Yeah. Including Doctor Strange, which in retrospect is interesting. You're like, oh, so they knew. They it was the known. algorithm. Yeah. But isn't that weird? It is weird. Um, and that's the thing. It's like trusted to data. It's sort of like, you know, he's willing to go through with it to do anything. But... <laughs> Who do you come away from that experience watching the movie going, fucking hell, that was frightening. Mm. Oh, fucking hell, that was... 
It's the supervillain. It's the, it's the dog. Alexander Pierce is the Emperor. The Winter Soldier's Darth Vader. And he does a Darth Vader role very well. And he Darth Vader's like... Darth Vader's like... Darth Vader's like, like Darth you read Vader. about. Yeah. Even in the first Star Wars, like, you know, Vader's not the guy behind everything. However, but he's, he's the villain. <laughs> he's not a man with whom to be fucked. Yeah. So, Alexander Pierce, absolute fucking honourable mention. It played brilliantly by Robert Redford. Um, who dipped out of retirement super briefly for the cameo in Endgame. Um, yes. Which was a nice touch. Because uh, they could have got any fucker to do that moment. But they were like, Robert, would you do it? And he's like, yeah, how much? How much for one day? Yep, yeah, sure, fuck it. Sure. I'll come in. Let's go. Um, and tie up the phase three phase three conclusion with a neat little bow. And be like, oh, a guy from Winter Soldier. Oh, a guy from this one. Oh, a guy from this one. Um, but it's Winter Soldier because I also... I've enjoyed Sebastian Stan and his appearances since in Civil War and his own show and the Avengers films. I think the most effective he's ever been as a presence is in this movie. He he can he can play likable. He can play so he can play the lovable dickhead who's seen some shit that he is after the, this film. Yeah, but he he understood this assignment in a way that has still stuck with me, like. The Winter Soldier in this is frightening. Like, he's really frightening. We get to see bits of it in Civil War as well, like the confrontation when he escapes the facility and stuff. But, like, good God. Just the, the, the relentlessness in this. And the thing that made me appreciate it even more is when we got to see him again super briefly in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Yeah. In the flashback in, in episode one. Um, he's scary, man. Like, he's proper... Now, I don't know if he's higher than a three scary. I, I Cause... don't know. Considering the way the case you're putting forward for him, I'd call him a four. Okay. Oh, God, think... my, I, I've argued too well. I think the, I think the <laughs> only thing that's stopping him from being higher, really, is the fact that he, he's mute. Yeah, he's so a he doesn't. So he doesn't have that... Um, War of words, that 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 war of philosophies that you do with a lot of these villains, which kind of elevate them, that we'll get to as we go down further the list. Mm. Um, Plus, he's a one and done. Like he's he, a one and done. We see him in that role or force into that role briefly in a couple of other things. Yeah, but this is his only time as the antagonist, and and as a result, you don't sort of get to see the extent of where that as a, that that character as a villainous force could go. So three or four. I'm angling three, but I, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm as a point of pathetic pride. If I've talked you round to a four, then I'm going to accept. <laughs> Fuck it, let's do a four. <laughs> Why not? Soldier gets a four, and it's the best MCU movie. So, so it deserves it. Uh, on the other end of the scale, Ronan the Accuser. Ronan the Flipping Accuser from Guardians of the Galaxy, played by Lee Pace, who is a phenomenal actor, does a great job, acts like. Billy O through all that makeup. But criminally underused. Ronan is the opposite of Loki in Avengers. Yeah. Ronan is there to facilitate the story about the protagonists. Yeah. Whereas Loki feels like he's at a level pegging with the Avengers. I, until he gets the Power Stone, I didn't feel like Ronan was guaranteed to get out of an encounter against the tree and the raccoon yeah. and everyone... If they had planned, you know, if they planned to defeat yeah. them. Now, obviously, we see them get their ass handed to them earlier on and nowhere. Yeah. But that's mostly because they're not quite together. Drax goes out on his own and, you know. Yeah. And that's not to say Ronan ain't intimidating. Like, Thanos ain't booking you unless you're going to do some shit. That's true. You know what I mean? Thanos is recruiting you if he thinks you can fuck shit up. And he does chat some shit to Thanos as well. Mm. Oh, yeah, he talks which back is, to it. Proper which does. is always a show of fucking uh, strength. Yeah. And, and, and Thanos does sort of. Like, he blinks. Like, when, when Ronan is sort of like, you know, you call me boy and all that stuff. And he's like, when he gets the power stone, you see Thanos in the, in the broadcast thing sort of go like, oh, I guess I'm going to have to fucking deal with this. Yeah. And hangs up the call. And you're like, oh, Thanos is a bit, in, if not intimidated, he's annoyed at the inconvenience. He's like, oh, boss. So like, fucking hell, here we go. Ronan is essentially the fifth child of Thanos in terms of the, the children of Thanos, the the, yeah. the, the Black Order. Um, he's just off doing his own thing. He's not hanging out with the other four. Uh, he's also trusted enough by Thanos to basically babysit his daughters. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Gamora and Nebula do answer to Ronan. 
Well, so, he, so he's more all, or less so. Yeah, but like he's obviously he's he's intimidating and respected enough as a force that they're like, fine, we'll go with him on this. Fine, we'll make this work. Whatever, mm. we'll get the power stone. We'll we'll do that for you, father. Fealty to father, etc., etc. Um, and I think Lee Pace does a great job. I just, I don't see him as more than a two star villain. No, he just doesn't get enough to do. Yeah, we don't really get to see him take names either. Not really. Very much. Like he beats the fuck out of Drax. But but then he he dance off, bro. In terms of in terms of dudes with hammers, he's not on the higher end of the MCU hammer scale. Yeah, I I kind of wish we'd seen a tiny bit more of him in Captain Marvel when we met him pre his days as as uh, a villain. Yeah, that would have been nice. Just to sort of get a sense of what leads to the corruption. Two. But he's a two. And again, great performance. Lee Pace is great. Guardians of the Galaxy is a great fucking movie. And Ronan is a perfect part of that puzzle. Mm. But he ain't on any lunchboxes. I'm interested to see where this one goes. Ultron. From, played by James Spader. From Age of... From Ogron. Age of... No, Ultron. Age of Ultron. Ultron. Sorry. Um, Google it, kids. I've got to be nice. Uh, um, Age of Ultron, the second Avengers movie. James Spader is the voice of Ultron. We have that movie and something else to go off of now. Yeah. Because since Age of Ultron, we've also seen what happens in the show What If, if Ultron had won. But honestly, I don't think it adds too much. No, in that, again, he's he's an interesting concept mm. in What If, but it's it he is then a function yeah. to for an action set piece finale I think more than should, anything. I think he's Mark standard... Quan does a decent job of playing oh, yeah. as well. No, he's okay, also yeah. reprising the role on the Disney Cruises. Ah. Um the Disney Cruise, uh one of the, the big ones they're about to open, uh is gonna have a Marvel thing. Yeah. A Marvel like show, like a, a theatre effect show mm. um where uh Ultron is the villain. Uh part of it has survived and is affecting this thing. Uh, the lead characters are Ant Man and the Wasp as played by um Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly. Okay. And uh, also reprising their roles will be, um, if I remember correctly. Well, it's lovely to uh, know, but it's not what we're talking Brie about. Brie Larson is Captain so, Marvel and uh, Anthony Mackie is Captain America. Right, let's get back so to the like, point. So it's like, that's kind of cool. So there'll be more Ultron out yes. there, is what I'm saying. Like, he's not gone. So no hard feelings to anyone who loves him when we say, he's fine. He's fine. He works really he's... well in his film. Like, yes. he, he, he's intimidating and I... I I think the disconnect is the fact that he's a completely CGI creation in yeah. a way that doesn't hamper other CGI villains. No. Like Thanos, I believe. I believe that that is a, a character. Ultron, not so much. Ultron, not so much. And I think part of that is... Weirdly, I think part of that is due to the fact they made him emotive in his face. Yeah. I think had it been this it's horrible too... static mask that just like glowed when he spoke... It's a bit too fluid, isn't it? It's, it's well done. Mm. But like... Too flexible. And I also wonder, Spader does a great performance, and I see the angle that Joss Whedon <laughs> script and everything came from, which is, it's it's a mirror to Tony. He is he's brought about because Tony and Bruce are like, we need to put a suit of armor around the world. Yeah. So they create this thing based on Jarvis using the Mind Stone. Well, they don't know is the Mind Stone yet, but yeah, and and we get Ultron. And he's a bit of everybody, and his attitude is mostly Tony's. And I get it. I get it. The idea is it's Tony's dream turned into a nightmare. I just... Ah, I just wonder what it would have been like had they gone for a more robotic, just relentless force. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't have cast Spader. No. Likely you wouldn't have cast Spader. And, and it probably wouldn't have been as memorable a character but I think he would have been a, a, a more solid threat maybe like this Ultron gets distracted for example yeah and that's um, a very human quality which means you're not doing much unique with your relentless machine like the Ultron that we see in What If is still sarcastic and pithy but he's very much driven yeah. Whereas this, what Ultron is, he can he can be thrown off of his path. Um, I like the design. I just kind of wish they'd gone. I mean, looking at the toy even on the shelf, like he looks freaking creepy. Well, that, is a, that is a creepy, creepy boy. Yeah. But just yeah, 
Yeah. Neat little nods with his final body having sort of like the curved arms and the shoulder, the elbows and things like that. And, and the, you know, uh, him briefly wearing a red cape yeah. and stuff. And it's like, okay, sure, as, as, as a hood. and But yeah, I think, I think, I, I don't think he's a one. Yeah. It is too good to be a one, but I don't think he's, I don't think he makes three. I think he's a two. No, yeah, okay, yeah. He's a two. You sit with that? You sit with two? I can sit with two. You sit with two? It's, again, it's 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 uh, a bit of a flat script elevated by an excellent performance. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I take that. Yeah, I take that. Do you know what else I take? Corey Stoll, just rub yourself on his bald head. Right on his right on his yeah. chrome dome. Yeah, you should watch. The, you should watch the strain. It's really disconcerting because he has hair for most of it. That would be weird to me. It is weird because we're talking, of course, about Corey Stoll. As Darren Cross yep. in Ant-Man. Don't, um, don't make him cross. You won't like him when he's Darren Cross. Uh, yellow? <laughs> jacket. Let me get my jacket. My yellow jacket. Good God. Uh, what is happening? <laughs> I'm, Magic. I'm, I'm breaking up words yeah. into two words. Right. Bond, James Bond style for comedic effect. Oh. Allegedly. Did it, did it work? No. Uh, <laughs> um... Darren Cross is great. In this, again, for Ant-Man, he's not a memorable villain in the grand scheme, but Corey Stoll brings so much energy to this. He's so boo hiss as well. Mm. Like he's one of the yeah. few he's one of the few villains that is just straight up boo! Boo, you bad man! Boo! And I do like villains like that. You don't get them often enough. Like Grey Area is great, but sometimes you just want someone to go, Oh fuck you, he's so evil, I hate him! And 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 Corey Stoll as Darren Cross. Does that brilliantly. Darren yeah. is a very unlikable character, played very charismatically. Yeah. Um, by Corey. Uh, I mean, for fuck's sake, one of the first things he does on a scene on his own is have a sheep exploded in an experiment to try and shrink it. Like they do not want you to like him, and it, the way he plays it off is like, ah, right, load in the next one, and she's like, what the fuck, you son of a bitch. Um, the yellow jacket armor is creepy. Um, like with it, with the pincers coming over the shoulders, like it's the film's version of the collar of the armor and in, in, of the suit in the comics. Like Yellow Jacket, obviously, Hank Pym and other characters have been Yellow Jacket. Wasn't um, wasn't Clint Barton Yellow Jacket briefly? No, you're thinking of Goliath. Okay, wait, which one did they share? Oh no, that's no, sorry, it was it was Ronin. Hank Pym has been Ronin briefly. No, no he hasn't. I'm sure, he has. No. Nope. Uh, Are there just a load of characters who wear black and yellow costumes, and I'm confusing them? No, Clint Barton's been Goliath. Clint Barton as was, has. Clint Barton was Batman. You're thinking of Goliath, mate. You're thinking of Davy. It. You're thinking of Davy. Guaranteeing it. I guarantee. No, now you're thinking of Gambit. Yeah. No, you're thinking of Gambit. I'm always thinking of Gambit. He's all right, isn't he? I like Yellow Jacket a lot. The problem is, at this point, a formula has made itself very apparent. Especially in the form of Ultron, and especially in the form of um, uh, 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 Whiplash, and Ironmonger, and Abomination. There's a bit of a pattern that the villain is just the hero in a different suit when it comes to the visuals and the final clash. So though the fight between two shrinking characters at the end of Ant-Man is fucking great, and Peyton Reed does an amazing job with it, the fight yeah. in the bedroom is hilarious with the Thomas the Tank Engine set playing a big role in, in the confrontation and everything. Um, that's down to the mechanics of the fight being what's interesting, not necessarily Yellow Jacket, because Yellow Jacket yeah. is just other Ant-Man. Um, and again, not Corey's fault. I, however, though, would push for a three over a two. I think his performance is that over, do you think enjoyable. Over Ultron? Uh, yeah, I do personally. Not not by spades, uh, spade, but like I I could have very happily watched more of Darren Cross in that film. I would have happily had more scenes with him. Yeah, okay. Um, and and I would have I would have happily seen him come back because I would like to see a more practical Justin Hammer character who is like, no, I'm gonna fucking get you back for this and really go him too far. But of course we don't get that because he gets a really fucking gruesome death. That's true. Um, and also continues the phase two 
uh, Empire Strikes Back reference, where every villain yeah. in Phase 2 loses an arm at some point. I'll buy that. Uh, which is weird. Except in Thor The Dark World, where Loki loses an arm, and he's a secondary arm. I'll buy that. No, Thor, oh, no, Thor loses, loses an arm. Thor loses an arm. Who else loses an arm? Does Malekith lose an arm? Oh, well, I think when the ether consumes... Oh, I don't who know. cares? Do you know who I does care? care? Deeply, in fact. Who's that? affected his whole life. Who's that? The primary antagonist, unquote, of Captain America Civil War. Because, yes, we're counting him this time. We're counting him properly this time. Full on. Because we've seen him do more villain shit since, so he has to count as an antagonist, as a supervillain. Helmut, then Baron, Zemo, played by Daniel Brühl. Helmut Zemo. The big boy in his hole. Sounds wrong. Yeah, <laughs> tell me about... why. What, what's so great about Helmut Zemo, apart from the fact that he's played with absolute fucking wonderful enthusiasm by Daniel Brühl in both Civil War and Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Uh, well, um, that that coat, mate, that coat, that coat does a lot of work. Uh, we coat. we we've we've like put characters like um, or we me have put characters like Alexander Pierce and others on the back burner a bit for being strategists and and puppet masters, but even though that is also what Zemo does, he's so hands on. This could mm. go horribly wrong at any moment. Zemo is the closest this series gets, I think, really to like a Mission Impossible James Bond kind of villain. Especially in Civil War. Yeah. Uh, and not because he's got a distinct accent and um, ends up being a secret millionaire with planes and <laughs> all that shit. Like, uh, and has a golden gun. Uh, he um, <laughs> He's on the ground. Shit could go wrong at any second. And it's completely up to him to get that stuff done. He's motivated by a backstory that we are told in the in the minimal in the most minimal way that is then punctuated and is an absolute emotional gut punch when you realize that the voicemail he's been listening to is the same one over and over again throughout the movie because he can't bring himself to deleting it because it's the last word he heard from his wife prior to them dying in Sokovia in Age of Ultron yeah he's the ultimate villain created by Tony Stark really yeah. Like this this guy is he's never going to stop. He is never going to be satisfied. Yeah. His entire goal is to have the heroes tear themselves apart. He doesn't want to rule the world. Mm. He doesn't want to kill off a bunch of potential threats so that he can stay in power. Mm-hmm. He doesn't want to wipe out humanity. Humanity! He, my favourite aquatic thing. He friend. just wants the, the heroes to suffer. If that ain't the most supervillain motivation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, to do whatever the hero... To do the complete opposite of what the hero does, but to do it directly to them. Like, this, this is... This is... This is... Your blow fell. This is Dr. X. This is the Shredder. Like he, do you know what I mean? It's like his entire thing is, I'm going to... F- fucking I'm, action man guy over here. He's, What's this? He's still, Dr. fucking X. What did Dr. X exist to do? Sell toys. What did he do in the commercials? Fight action man. What else? That's it. That's, that's all it. he fucking That's all did. he does, yeah. And that's yeah. kind of what Zemo is all about. Even in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, when his... <laughs> Mission wasn't quite accomplished, but you get the sense that he's like, no, I'm happy because everything's ruined now. Mm. Like, I've screwed everyone over and it's never going to stop. And he's he, by the time of Falcon and the Soldier, he's right. There are still pieces being picked up. Yeah. Um, and, when, and and even when it's like, no, 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 like, the world, we defeated Thanos and everybody's good and everyone's getting back together and it's going to be wonderful. It's like, yeah, even then, oh, look, the American government now trying to do their own version of you guys. Yeah. I've broken apart the event. Like, the Avengers and what it meant is fucked. And it's because of me. And the effects are still being felt now from the actions he takes in Civil War. They are still being felt. Then, obviously, Daniel Brühl gets to play the supervillain angle of him up a little bit more in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Um, As we realise that he is actually in money. He is technically a baron. For some reason, he has a purple mask he quite likes. They don't elaborate on it. Kind of hoping they will in the future um, at some point. But yeah, I I, th- I think he's a four. Just because the effects of what he did there are still being felt in the narrative. Meaning, he's one of the few supervillains who 
kind of won. Like, he won. He he achieved what he wanted to achieve in that first appearance. And the effects are still being felt. Plus, we're getting to see him do that dance. So... That, yeah. Little, Just little, a little fist. That's all we need. Little fist pumpy dance. Just need a little fist. I think Zemo's a four, man. I think, I think he's, he's not a strong four, but I think he definitely is more than a three. Yeah, all right. Um... Just on the basis of being a fucking baller. Mm. He's a baller boy. Not to be confused with the ball boy. Uh, Ball's boy. We move to Doctor Strange and not Baron Mordo, because he ain't a baron and he ain't a villain yet. Not to Dormammu, though we have come to bargain. The villain of Doctor Strange is Mads Mikkelsen's <laughs> Kaecilius. Yeah. An, a, an apostle, a student of Dormammu. Um... So, the, the Mordo role for a lot of other adaptations. Yeah. Um, though they aren't dicking around with the voice of Tony Jay and creating Carnage, the Spider-Man animated series. Yeah, characters. well. Um, um, Guy Gilius, uh I think it's another Darren Cross. Really? I I loves me some Mads, but I I wouldn't give him that much k- a kudos, personally. I think it just comes down to how much you like Mads Mikkelsen, I guess. That, and not like... How much you like him in this? It's how, how much you like you, him generally? You like him going in? I think. Uh, it's, yeah, that's fair. It's. That's I fair. think it's a wasted casting. And here's something interesting I learned. I don't think it's quite as bad as the the uh, uh, Christopher Eccleston wasted casting. Well, this is what I learned from a, from a, uh, an interview with Chris Eccleston not too long ago. The other actor who was up for the role of Malekith the Accursed was Mads Mikkelsen. <sighs> so this was obviously a we really want to work with Mads. We'll find a role for you at some point. Because keep in mind, around the time of um, Doctor Strange coming out, Hannibal's fucking rating smash. Like, he's a household name by this point. Not enough of a rating smash to keep him going past season three, but whatever. No, but like, we live in the, the age whatever. of... Whatever. We live in the age of Netflix shows. Nothing's ever good enough for the companies that just want to save money every now and again, regardless of whether they do well or not. I want my Silence of the Lambs adaptation, you motherfuckers. <laughs> do it as a film. Fuck it, why not? Do it as a movie. Because they've got that Clarice series on now. Yeah, which is completely different and yeah. separate from all of them, and they can't use half the characters. And Fuck it. Weird. Yeah, um, uh, I I think with this, it was a case of they really wanted to work with him, they put him into something, and he's he's good. I think another actor would have made this a more memorable part. Yeah. Now, he has one of the most sort of strong scenes, I think, for a villain in all the series, in terms of a, as a performer, not as a villain. Which is the, um, we've all dreamt of having ourselves tied up like that around Mads Mikkelsen or having Mads Mikkelsen tied up like that around us sequence. Hmm. Where, uh, I ain't shaming anybody. Um, send your fan art to bigdamncontact at gmail.com. Uh, but in that scene, he says an awful, he does an awful lot whilst being very stoic and trying not to show any weakness. Like, it's, it's the bit where he breaks down into tears like while just talking, but is completely stoic and stony faced as he's saying it to Strange. Yeah, and he's essentially talking about like, I, like I've seen it. There is nothing that's out there, and that's more important than this. Yeah, like that is way more important than what you have going on here. Like this is bullshit, and you can you can see the the drive behind them and the, the betrayal he feels of the Ancient One and everything. Like just. There's a lot going on, but a lot of that is down to Mads Mikkelsen doing the heavy lifting. I think had you cast a different actor who came at it a different way, you would have had a more interesting version of the character, quite possibly, in terms of like tone. Uh-huh. But I also think that the script wasn't giving many to work with. It's it's very much a Malekith situation. I don't think it's that bad though. I don't think it's as bad as Malekith. Not as bad. No, it's not as bad as Malekith, but it, it it's it's certainly more that than say. You know, a, a Winter Soldier or what have you. Are we putting him at a two, you reckon? I think a two. A two, a yeah. two for Mads. Two for Mads Mikkelsen as Caecilius. Um, practical makeup's great. Like, when I first saw Behind the Scenes, yeah, I was like, oh shit, yeah. that eye stuff's practical. They just they just added the lights in yeah. afterwards. Like, it's oh, nice that's that. creepy. Nice bit of makeup. But it's also like, again, Doctor Strange is very much a, an origin movie in the same style as Iron Man, where it's more about the main character than it is the villain. So. Ego! The Living Planoyet, played by absolute charisma magnet slash machine slash generator Kurt Russell. Yeah. In Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2, The Year of Our Lord 2017. I think this is a really fascinating um, example of using an actor's charisma to make you buy into them so that the villain twist 
hurts even more. Yes, because and the marketing yeah. for this movie never lent into who the villain was. Nope. Comic fans are going, he's playing Ego the Living Planet. He's going to be the villain. Yeah. But the film does not play that. And it, it, what's nice is it's a twist, but it's a creeping twist. Yeah. It begins giving little warning signs as, like, Gamora, for example, is exploring that world. Yeah. And and Mantis's story making you sort of go, wait, what? Yeah, some like, of the stuff Mantis is saying being a bit, hang on. Plus the idea that, wait, so this is your dad and you left. Why did you Why did you leave his mum? What's going on, yeah. really? It's a creeping reveal. And... and but that's because the way Kurt Russell plays it is he plays it the way Ego is playing it to Peter Quill. Yeah. He's the great dad. And yeah. I'm not forcing myself onto you, but I'd like to get to know you. And isn't this brilliant? We're literally fucking playing catch. Aren't we having a great time? Okay, cool. Now I've got your attention. Uh, we're going to destroy the universe together. Yeah. Um, uh, but that's cool because like, I always wanted someone to pass it on to and, and hang out with. And that's you. So this is great, right? This is cool. And it, it's it's and then he gets pretty freaking creepy when he does go full on like fuck you I mean, right down to that like that's my father like zombie thing sticking out the ground made of light and rocks screaming at them. Yeah. Um I think it's a three. I what's, think it's what I think stops it's a you three. from putting it up to a four. I don't think it's a five. I think what stops me bringing it up to a four is the characters in the character is very OP. Like he is, you know, he he's a fucking world. Yeah, he can go beyond that world and plant seeds of himself in the ground and fucking impregnate a lot of people. Yeah, but like as far as like a supervillain, he is he's he's a huge power. There's a reason why Ego is never like the main villain or listed as like a rogues gallery member for characters. Yeah. Like he crosses paths with the Fantastic Four and Silver Surfer and stuff. But he's Thor. never like, Thor. But he's never like oh, Ego is one of their villains. It's like ego's an obstacle, ego's a thing, ego's a specific adventure that they encounter or have to deal with. And because how do you fucking bring a planet with a face down to the level of a character you can interact with on the reg? Some writers will try it, some writers will do a great job with it. But he's 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 too much. He's too much in as as a four. He's he's too undefined and yet also too specific. Like the thing that makes him a really good villain in this movie and in the MCU is the duplicitous shit that he pulls with the women he falls in love with and then casts aside. Yeah. The dude plants cancer in people because he's like, I legit loved your mother, but that's distracting me. So I had to give her the cancer. So did you ever really love her? Are you capable of such an emotion? But And, and I, I love how that is... It's still never clarified but it's like it's left to open to viewer interpretation to me yeah he did i think he genuinely felt something kind of special with her but yeah. he probably did with all of them so even yeah. then it's like fucking hell that what makes him really villainous and horrible is the personal stakes yeah as a super villain i don't think the ego plan is as interesting or as compelling as the yeah but you killed my mom side of it Okay. So for me, he's an amazing villain, and that kind of overshadows the supervillain side a little bit. It's a really strong three for me personally. Like, do do you do you think he goes up higher? Do you think he's a four? No, I just I just wondered if there was anything that could push him up there. I think he's a strong three, a very strong three. Mm. But I don't think he's got anything that just edges him over. Well, that's the thing with the four. Like, if you put him in the four, then he's contending with. Um, Zemo and Winter Soldier in Winter Soldier and I just I think mm. I think those guys just have a little bit more of a oh fuck yeah they were oh or in Zemo's case oh yeah it's still happening okay okay yeah so I, I think he goes a three okay, um, yeah. I, before we just need one I need to get a drink I'm absolutely parched oh does that mean that in the meantime I can uh, well I could go get you a drink no it's alright I'll get myself a glass of water or something okie okay, dokie okay. in the meantime you, you I can shit. I can tell these fuckers all about how they can get in touch with us do you think anything of what we're saying so far is utter bullshit you probably do and that's fine. I, I'll allow it, in a way, as I allow you all to live. For that is the extent of my power. But if you have any thoughts on this so far, uh, or by the end of it, of course, you can leave us a comment.
down below on YouTube if you're there, or on SoundCloud. You can probably listen to us on Spotify or on your Apple Podcasts. If so, thanks for that. But don't forget, you can email the show at any time. Any questions you ever want to send in, whether they're topic-related or you just want to get our opinion on stuff, bigdamncontact at gmail.com. You can also help keep the lights on here at the podcast by going to patreon.com slash bigdamncast. Helps us cover the storage space online. Plus, the more patrons we get, the more special features we'll put out for you to enjoy. May I avail myself of the can of your finest Coca-Cola, sir? You may absolutely drink Thank a can of my finest. Imagine if you come all the way up here and I went, no. no I'm just going back downstairs. You'd have to take it back down. Um, see, normally in other I podcasts... It, I would have put it down the back of your jumper. I like that, though. Yeah. See, in other podcasts, what would have happened there is there would have been a, either a noise to distinguish that that was going to be a bit of an ad read, or no noise at all, which makes it really annoying. You turn your fridge up too far. This has got frozen bits in it. Yay! I ain't complaining. Do you know who's you know com- you know complaining? What? Segway doesn't work. Hey, Spider-Man uh, Homecoming's Adrian Toomes. I think this is a great, great villain because mm. it's got it's got both a a real world sort of grounded origin that takes into account the more fantastical elements of the ground level everyday life in the MCU. Yeah, I think it's an a alien great invasion screws up New York and a clean yeah. out crew lose their business because they now yeah. are deemed unfit to deal with stuff like this. Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, they've got a really good connection to the uh, protagonist, which isn't clear until really late on. And that's another thing too. We're in a Spider-Man movie now. Yeah. And what Spider-Man villains do real fucking well is... Uh, up the personal stakes yeah. of Peter Parker yeah. in some way. Which I think is a great example of this because they are... Um, pardon me. They are... This is a teenage boy yeah, who's having to deal with a threat that could horribly ruin his life, never mind his superhero life, in a way that in itself would expose his superhero life and all that stuff. And with Spider-Man, what you want is you want a character who is both a physical and intellectual threat to... Spider-Man, and although Toombs isn't as intelligent as Peter, on like a, for it on like a pure intelligence level, he is very smart and mm. can tr- and is more experienced and can trick him and has all that stuff to bring to bear. He's I... a dad. He's a husband, and he's ruthless. Yes, he will. He will protect his wife and daughter. Yeah, and his investments and his own like livelihood. So he will go so far as to the point where he's like. He debates it, but then ultimately goes, no, I'm going to do it. He'll happily kill a teenager. Oh, yeah. He'll fucking do it. Yeah. He doesn't care. Like it gives him a warning. Look, if says, Montana gets yeah. blasted into atoms by accident, and Tim's like, fuck. Well, I intimidated everyone around me. Okay. All right, carry on. And he's like, oh, my God, he's gone too far. Um, Michael Keaton is excellent in this role. He is role. excellent. In oh, my role. God, he's excellent in this role. Um, like you said, there's that, that, that grounded side to it is is at this point refreshing. I think he's one of the more when rounded. Was that, when was the last characters? time we had one in the MCU? Actually, have we had one? I mean, I guess like Wh- Whiplash has fantastical powers, but so does the. I guess Whiplash is probably the closest prior to this to being like a, a more grounded antagonist. Yeah, but it's not. It's, the character's nowhere near as rounded and well developed. Oh no, but it, but it's that thing of guy has yeah. tech and uses it to do thing to get revenge. Is there a reason we can't put Vulture at five? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, let's look at let's look at let's look at his standout moments. Yeah. Fight on the fight on the convoy. Yep. Fight on the ferry. Yep. Uh, fight at Coney Island. Intimidation in the car. That scene alone is a highlight of the MCU and is one of the best scenes in a Spider-Man movie, hands down. Yeah. It's the so, moment where the he works of the it fucking, out, the use of the fucking traffic light yeah, in that moment, when it just when he works everything out, brilliant. Just that's so good. Then you've got um, the scene in the warehouse where Peter, who at this point depowered, like it's just him and his superpowers in his fucking pajama suit, rocking up to do his thing. Tombs leaves him to die. Mm. But as far as a villain's concerned, as far as supervillain's concerned. What happens after that moment? The warehouse collapses down around Peter and Peter is screaming and crying under the rubble. And for the first time ever, that film, outside of high school shenanigans, that film slaps you around the face and goes, this is a child. Yeah. This is a fucking child. And he is 
going to die and he is terrified. Because the fact last time we saw him, first time we see him in the MCU, that's not going to happen. No. None of the heroes in the fight in Civil War no are going to kill, kill Spider Man. So we finally see the real world consequences for him putting his neck out yeah. on the line. You know, um, this is what this is why I really think Homecoming is a great Spider Man film. Oh, I love it. The last twenty minutes specifically, like the last 20, yeah. 25 minutes from from the prom yeah, to the, the end, uh, from the prom onwards, yeah, it's so it's really good, so so good. I mean, arguably, it begins the moment Peter goes up to Liz's door and the door opens. Yeah, and you're like, oh, we're in the third act oh now, baby. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And also, again, striking, scary. Vulture's got the same sort of presence as the Winter Soldier does. Yeah, yeah. Like when the vulture rocks up, you go fucking hell! Look at that! Like the the talons on the boots and the fact that he's just yeah going for it. Um, he overshadows the other villains in the movie because you know Tinker is in it. We get two versions of the Shocker. Like so there's a few bad guys in there. Sneaky cameo from the um, Aaron Davis uh, Prowler as well, played by um, Donald Glover. So we get like you know yeah. there's a, there's a few Spidey villains being subtly subtly used and subtly seeded, but. You don't pay any fucking attention because the vulture. Fuck me, the vulture. I mean, Scorpion's in it even. Jesus Christ. Um, I think he's a five. Yeah, I think he's a five. And I think it's because Keaton can Keaton can intimidate like a motherfucker as well. Like, ego is intimidating because of the scale of what he can do. Yeah? Mm. Vulture's intimidating because you know people like that. Yes. You know someone like yeah. that. You know someone who is like, I'm, just, what, doing, yeah. I'm just doing this yeah. to look after me. And my family. And it's like, yeah, but what you're doing is resulting in grave harm to other people. Don't give a fuck. I'm looking out for my family. There are better ways. I don't give a fuck. I am going to hurt you. Yeah. It's like, okay. <laughs> and obviously at the end you realise when Peter saves his life, he's having a bit of a... A moment. Maybe I need to rethink, but it all depends on what Sony and fucking does with And he keeps his secret. He does keep he a secret. He does keep, keep Peter's secret. He does keep a secret. Now in January, we'll see whether or not uh, Sony uh, fuck him up, but sure. He's a five. We've got two fives. We've got two fives. Can we get a third? Let's find uh, out. Not with this one, I don't think. Thor Ragnarok. Hella. I love Kate Blanchett in this. I would For I would various argue, reasons. I would argue she's up there as one of the more entertaining villains. Certainly one of the more entertaining. Mm. But and visually striking. Very visually and striking. Goth Kate Blanchett, I'll be honest, that was an awakening. It's, it's a thing. Was it an awakening though? I'd always like Kate Blanchett. I didn't fancy Kate Blanchett until I saw Goth Kate Blanchett. That yeah, did something. It was like it was like it was like Jessica Chastain. I was like, yeah, okay. And then I saw her in Mama, and I suddenly was like, okay, this is a yeah. look. This is a look. This I mean, is the a look, look that real does it, it, This yeah, does something yeah, I for get me. It. I get it. Um, um, and and she's she's intimidating. She's scary. It's a revenge driven thing. The sins of the father is essentially the whole angle of this story. Yeah, it, it's that whole thing of like, oh, by the way. Soon as I die, your secret sister's gonna show up and want to kill everyone. Uh, Soz boys, <laughs> bursts into light, disappears. Um, uh, the way she just instantly sort of recruits Scourge with, through subtle intimidation of just like, right? I mean, I just killed them. You're gonna yeah. join me? He's like, yep, okay. And it's partially because you know that Scourge is feeling. A little bit sort of undervalued, like he's just sort of taken on Heimdall's job, not because he's good for it, but because he's been, you know, we need someone to do it. You do it. He's like, oh, okay. And he's always trying to make the most of something to benefit himself. Yeah. And in this instance, the, 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 the Heimdall's job gave him the benefit of being able to pop to other realms on the sly and collect things for his own, like, sort of, you know, for, to show off and try and get girls. Yeah. And then when it comes to Heller, it's like, oh yeah, the benefit he gets here is he won't die <laughs> if he sides with her. Mm. Um, he never gets to live out his executioner comic book mantle, really, because he doesn't kill anyone in the film. Um, but he, uh, you know, he does the right thing. Heller drives him to it. She's that scary that this dude is like, oh fuck. She takes out the Warriors Three like they're nobody's business, um, which you know. In terms of points for her, that's cool. Yeah. She's intimidating. In terms of points for the movie, it's the one thing I hate about that film, just mm. how quickly they are dispatched. Mm. Uh, except for Hogan, who's like, we didn't get as much time in the second one, so we'll give you a bit more time in this one. But <laughs> False Dagger Fandral's just going to get fucking slaughtered oh, those guys, in seconds. Yeah. That guy's got... 
Look, Ray Stevenson's like, I, just, I hate wearing all this beard. Can you? Just, I'm really warm. I hate all the beard. And and uh, and Zachary Levi's like, I've got this other thing to do at Warner Brothers. Like, we'll free your schedule up. It's fine. Here yeah, you go. Yeah. Um, Bye. <laughs> Bye. Um, uh, she's really entertaining. She beats the fuck out of Thor. We don't get she to see that very beat often. The fuck out of Thor. She plucks his goddamn eye out. I, yeah. She plucks his goddamn eye out. She doesn't pluck it out. She cuts it out. Cuts it out. She's like, I'm, what was it? I'm the goddess of death. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she is the goddess of death. Um, um, the little death. Um, <laughs> really? Le petit morte. Uh, um, yeah, she, uh, she's really, really good. But again, she's kind of, she belongs to this film. And she's just, uh, going back to what we said about what made Vulture so great, she's not as rounded as a, a character. Few yeah. of them are. And that's really the only thing that loses her points. Like she's, she's a little more Saturday morning cartoon, which is not necessarily a down vote in itself, but it, 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 there's less to chew on. It's not as memorable. Yeah. She she sort of is, and this is, this is a circumstance of the series, she was really memorable and striking at the release of the movie because she was and it's weird that it took this long, the first female antagonist for an MCU movie. Um, And we need more of those, please. But uh, at the same time, like, legacy-wise, like, Ragnarok's mostly remembered for the film and its tone and and the Hulk team-up. Do you want to give it a four, though, just because she is so good? I think she she tips into four territory. Yeah. Yeah. it's it's not a strong four. She just tips in, I think, and 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 I would say that I think it was a I think it was a bad call for Hella and her potential and Kate Blanchett's performance to kill her off. I think with Hella you could have seen a Loki style like not come back around to being a hero, but definitely a superstar villain in the series. Nothing had a she potentially more, Chris. A, a certainty, uh. Because she gets destroyed by... Killmonger! Sir, kill... Five. Well, Next. well, 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 let's let's talk it through. N- no, do we need to? Yes. Do we need to? Because we have given fucking excellent. We have taken points off of some of the villains for just being the same as the hero in the final fight beating each other up. We have also given passes to some of those things for just being entertaining sequences whereas like when he and T'Challa have their final fight in 2018's Black Panther yep. um, it's one of the it's one of the ropier looking confrontations when they're fighting on like the train line it, it's one of the few we sort of go that is a that is a bit video gamey that isn't it that's a bit weird thing is Michael B. Jordan's performance Michael B. Jordan baby Everything that I've realised, I've not even written his. I'm right the, on this chart. I've written the cast names. I've not written Michael B. Jordan. I've written Black Panther to remember myself which fucking Panther. film it is. Uh, Michael B. Jordan's performance as um, Eric Stevens, aka uh, Ned Dejaka, aka Killmonger, is so strong. It's such a strong performance. I'm going to say one it's, thing. Yes. And then I'm going to say five stars, and that's oh. going to be my last word on it. Oh. Bury me in the ocean with my ancestors who jumped from ships because they knew death was better than bondage. Five stars, there we go. Bye. That, it does kind of like sum up the power of that role. Killmonger is a villain who is, he is completely in the right. He's just doing everything wrong. His methodology is horribly distorted. Yeah. Like, all he wants, or all he wanted initially was for black people the world over to not be oppressed ever again. What that's evolved into is we need to kill everyone else. Yep. And my homeland, my my country, my, my hidden technological utopian um, land of origin has the capability to do this. Mm-hmm. It just needs me to utilise it, me to get it. He has schemed for years. He has got to this point. He has used people along the way. Like, you know, another honourable mention was never going to be in the chart because he's not a main villain, but fuck is he fun? Ulysses Claw, Andy Circus. Yeah. Like, he's, you know... And again, the ball's on him for that. As, like, fans of Black Panther, it's yeah. like Claw is such a big antagonist. Like, Claw is the closest thing to a Green Goblin Joker kind of role in the Black Panther mythos. Yeah, I guess, I guess. And for them to go, oh, yeah, no, he's the secondary villain and we're going to fucking kill him off. Yeah. 
yeah. and we're gonna we're gonna have him we're gonna have him usurped by Killmonger, who is a really fun villain in the comics, but was never a big thing. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. This movie changed that a little bit. They've been utilizing that character and those that is sort of legacy a lot more since this movie. <laughs> and can you blame him? Uh well, quite. But like Yeah, it's uh, he makes an impact. He does make an impact. He makes a fucking impact. He also also gets the Willem Dafoe uh, badge of honour for meme ability. Yeah. Is this your king? Dominated the internet for the better part of a year. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is this your king? <laughs> is this your king? He's not. Um, he's a villain you are sad to see get killed off. Because you're like, oh, I want to see more of him. That scene said, I, I think he wasted him. him in What If. True. But they wasted a lot of stuff in What If. True. And I'm not going to count his What If thingy because his What If no, plan is no. is a what if he did it from an earlier point but it's also a very it, it, it's an oddly different version of Killmonger. Like this Killmonger's had another like six, seven years to stew in his bitterness. Yeah. And again, his reasons for what he's doing are completely grounded in a real world genuine like continuous fuck up of inequality and, and racism and prejudice. Like, the world drove him to this. Yeah. The tipping point was his dad's his dad's murder yeah. at the hands of T'Chaka. Yeah. Um, I think he's a five. He is a five. Yeah. Not thinking about he's it. He's intimidating. Because that's the thing as well. He's still a villain. He's yeah. still a bad guy. You completely see where he's from. Yeah. And you completely get it. But that fucking moment where he just eyes up... Um, Shuri and Nakia at the at the battle at the end and his mask's off Yeah, and he just points that blade at him and the grin on his face is just I'm going to fucking get you and I'm going to enjoy it it's like Jesus Christ like yeah he's beyond the point of, of reasoning now like he's going to go over there and murder his cousin <laughs> do you know what I mean and he's already got a spot picked out for him Yes. Oh, gee. But it's it's that that grin for me sealed yeah. the deal that he's a great supervillain as well. Because yeah. by that point, he doesn't need to do that. He doesn't. He has the power that he could have them like fucking sent away, put to one side. He could knock them out, and instead, it's like blade pointed at him. Yeah. The, the grin on, on his yeah. face is the only thing I can compare it to. Is Loki's at the start of Avengers. Yeah. It's that same kind of like fucking get you, and you're like, yeah, that's terrifying. That is terrifying, and the way he enjoys the schemes that they do in the early part of the film. Like, he's... Yeah. Yeah. Grounded, beyond redemption, totally enjoying what he's doing. And just wonderfully performed. Yeah. B. And John's you, incredible. You want to talk about the horny factor? Oh, Jesus Christ. Ooh, right. Jesus Thanos. H. Christ. Thanos. This is my king. Thank you very much. This is my um, king. Um... Thanos. I think Thanos is a five. I think he's a five. I think he's a five For a lot of the same reasons. You've, you've grounded... Hmm. and given a grounded philosophy and believable philosophy to a big purple alien dude with a wrinkly chin. With a, with a squidward ball sack chin. Yeah. Yeah, he, he he comes from the same camp as Killmonger in that he has a he has a point of view... He has an extremist and a solution drive to a real problem. To a real problem, yeah, but his, his solution is far too beyond um, beyond, like, the rational... He's convinced himself. Yeah, the cure's worse than the disease in this case. Yeah, and 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 the the difference here is, Black Panther is a you know science fiction fantasy superhero movie, but like is Killmonger's it? thing is yeah, I think it was a documentary. <laughs> um, is it's not a documentary. The giveaway is that the Welsh flag is front and centre. Oh, and the yeah, okay, cool, cool. Um, which is so weird, but I love it because it got people going wait. Wales. There's an independent Wales in hey. the MCU. Um, so lucky bastards. But but you, Black Panther's story and Killmonger's arc is based in completely in reality. Yeah. Thanos's arc takes something that we see happening in reality. Yeah. But blows it up to sci-fi opera proportions. Yeah. So you are talking about a different, similar thread, different canvas. Yeah. Different paints being used. Um, Brolin's performance through his voice and through the motion capture is probably, for my money, the most likeable and believable CGI character since Gollum. Okay. Like there've yeah. been there've been others. Yeah. But not many have ever stuck with you in the same way that this does. Considering the character has so much screen time, mm. so many interactions, 
And also, out of the two films that Thanos stars in, he's the lead character of the first one. Okay. Infinity War is not about Tony and Steve and all the stuff going on with the Guardians and Thor. It's about Thanos. Yeah. We're watching everyone else react to him. Um, yeah, okay. The ending shot of the movie is him having won, looking over his fucking garden and smiling at a grateful universe, or one he hopes is grateful for. What, what did it done. cost? Everything. Oh! Um, the, the, the performance is perfectly balanced, as all things should be. I fucking love Josh Brolin in this. And then he gets to play the supervillain side of it in part two. Yeah. We've had hints of it over the movies, but like in part two, that Thanos' story concludes. That Thanos won. He got what he wanted. Yeah. He fucking wins. And then we get the time travel and we get to see what happens when Brolin plays a Thanos who gets a hint of the success and goes, oh my God, I did it. And that's why they're doing this. They're so fucking desperate to change what I did. I guess I'll have to go down there and teach him a fucking lesson. Helmet on, helicopter blade in hand. Like, so we get to see him be big bad supervillain antagonist without the kind of, the nuance of part one in Endgame. Without the the, the, the character drive of his being the plot of the movie. Yeah. But because of the legwork done in Infinity War, we know what is at stake for him when we meet past more evil Thanos in Endgame. So like he gets he get he gets he gets to do the best of both worlds. He gets to be more grounded and compelling and then he gets to be the Saturday morning cartoon villain who gives the heroes an excuse to have to step the fuck up. Without Thanos, we don't get arguably one of the most kind of bafflingly well pulled off finale sequence set pieces in a superhero movie ever made. Yeah. We don't get that entire final act of Endgame without the build-up of everything Thanos gave us. Um, and that ending shouldn't work. It should just be utter filth. Just like, it's too much noise. But it's noise that you've invested in by that point. Yeah. Because you give a shit. And you it's, know what he's focused on. on one thing, yeah. And you know what happens yeah. if he gets the fucking stones. Like, nope. Things are going to get even worse. It's going to happen again. Times ten. And we need to... Oh my god. It's, yeah. I, I, it's just a good performance, man. His scenes with Zoe Saldana, especially, and, and Karen Gillan. Um, what it brings out of the performers who play the Black Order, who, who play the children of Thanos, because they have to compliment him. Yeah. They get to be more sinister than him. Yeah. But that's fine, because even they bow to him. They show him undying fealty and all that stuff. You know, like, that's, that's their... He, Mission statement. In his first proper full scene as a character on screen, he comes in and he snaps Loki's neck. Yeah. It's like, hey, Planet, remember this guy you liked in that film you really liked a few years ago? <laughs> that guy's fucking dead. Next. So, I, he's a five, man. He's a five. Um, right. We've got to power through the rest of these now because you said you only had two hours and we've got over two hours. Yeah, it's okay. I've got, I've got time. Are you okay for time? I'm, I've got shit to do. Well, in that case... <laughs> yawn, wrong, yawn, wrong. Two. No, no, actually... No. First... Oh, we have one other. Shit. Oh, yes. Sorry. Got the list wrong. Ava Star slash Ghost. Played by Hannah John Kamen uh, in Ant-Man and the Wasp. I think you've got good motivation on this. I think you've got... However, I don't think she's as rounded a character. Threatening, but not as creepy as it could be. I'm going to put her at a strong three. Strong performance. Okay. Good motivation. <clears throat> okay. Interesting backstory, but just not as grounded or rounded. Not as gr- gr- ra- rounded <laughs> as someone like Vulture or Killmonger. I'd have to battle that a little bit. Where would you put them? I'd give her a one. And the really? reason the reason for that is is kind of simple. It's not again, I don't think anyone in this list is a bad actor. I think okay. everyone does a damn fine job with the roles they're given and they've been brilliant elsewhere. Uh, I just think with Ghost, you're missing a couple things. One, and I have to take this out of the equation, but I can't help but have it at the back of my head. The Ghost of the Comics is a no, terrifying. No, 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 no. About the I know. Ghost of the I'm removing that. I'm just getting it out of my system. Is a terrifying I think villain you're that, color your, that I would have loved to have seen. But here's my reason. No, here's my reasons why this this version of the character is lesser for me. Okay, here's the reason. Okay, okay. Ant-Man and the Wasp is ostensibly a comedy movie. Yeah, 
It's a comedy film first, a superhero movie second. Yeah. We know it's a comedy movie because of other cast members, like what people like Jimmy Woo are doing and everything. Like, it is absolutely... You are here to have a good time. The weight of the thing you just watched is pretty heavy, so we want to give you, like, a, a fun one. Continue the Ant-Man films. Yeah. Have yep. a laugh. You can have a villain in a comedy movie be effective, be kind of scary, but also fit into a comedy movie? She Do you doesn't, think that's she better doesn't... with Walton Goggins and his gang? Walton Goggins' gang, yeah, but again, they're not given enough to do. Yeah. Now, they're definitely comedy villains, but like I'm talking about, you know, your Sheriff of, Sheriff of Rottingham in Robin Hood Men in Tights. I'm that's talking a about, different no, no, kind no, of comedy movie, no, though, isn't it? No, but I'm talking about, like, Will, I'm just as an example, like Will Ferrell in Zoolander. Like, you can have comedy villains <sighs> who are weirdly unnerving... But still fit in that world. Yeah, but I think you're talking about like absurdist comedies there, Absur- whereas this oh, yeah. is not an absurdist oh, comedy. No, no. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wish the movie had found an angle where she could lean a little more into the film's tone overall. Because it feels like she's in a completely different film from the rest of the movie. <sighs> if there were a, if there were a slightly more grounded or dramatic leaning version of this film, she would she would be absolutely on top of the pile in what's going on in it. She really would. Her plight is no less frightening. Like, her performance is great. Her and Lawrence Fishburne, once they finally realise what's going on there, like, is... is touching. And it, it it's upsetting. And you feel so bad for her. But it's so out of place in the movie that even the conclusion to their story is, you're not a bad person. We're going to make sure you get your chance. Off you fuck. And then we see them in an alley go, ah, and then they leave. Even the film's like, have we got that out of the way? Good. Let's carry on with the fun times to wrap up the movie. She doesn't, if it were a different project, I think she'd have a chance to shine more. I think she's intimidating. Like, phasing a fucking hand into people and stuff and holding their hearts and everything. That's scary. I think you're making a good enough point for me to push her down to a two, but under extreme protest. I mean, I'll meet you at a two. I'll meet you at a two. Under protest, I'll go for a two. The design's cool, but, you know, just... Under protest, I'm going for a two on Ghost. In that's, 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 uh, in the comments, write down if you even remembered that character existed as we began this list. Because I'm curious as to how many people remember Ghost. If you have Ghosts, you have everything. Damn right. Just like Yon Rog. <gasps> Yon Rog! One. John Rog. And. Why that one? That might flippant. Why a one? Jude Law is really fun in this role. He is. That's it. That is it. Yon Rog is used to represent an idea, uh, which is patriarchal restraint. Yeah. It, it is. Men constantly going, "Oh, well done yeah. to women," and and be it, it, it's 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 um, what's that called when you when you're talking down to someone? Patron- patronizing. Patron- patronizing. He's patronite. Yeah. He's the pa- he's the he's the patronizing patriarchy personified as a character. That's it. Now that not to say that isn't effective in the narrative. Nothing Absolutely. about the sort of. Absolutely perfect in the narrative, and it it adds a wonderful fucking gut punch when he's like, "Right, come on, no powers, veers, you and me, let's go." And Carol just fucking blasts him and says, "Like, I, I don't like, I don't have to answer to you. Yeah, I have nothing to prove to you." Is a powerful moment, but it's because of what Yon Rog represents more so than what Yon Rog is as a character. Do you not have anything for the sort of bloodthirsty jingoism of an extremist regime that he also represents in how? Sort of true, but this guy ain't Vader and he ain't Tarkin. No, this but... is this is this is this is Imperial dude on the balcony with no railings watching the laser beam. Well, that's what I think it makes it worse or better from a storytelling point mm-hmm. of view because he is he's been brainwashed by his society. He's a true believer because mm. he's been told that's what he has to believe, and even seeing that the scrolls pose no threat, and even knowing. Mm. That he is, um, that he is going after defenseless civilians because he's been told to, mm. and for no other reason. He accepts that and goes with it. He goes with it with glee, and his team goes with him with it. 
Hmm. I mean, he does have it. He does have a, a merry band of of uh, mercenaries working for him, like yeah. Minerva and and Korath, who are just like, yeah, let's go, come on, like, isn't this fun? And at the beginning of the movie, we are led to yeah. believe that Veers is part of that group. Like, they're all mates, and everything's great, and aren't we wonderful? And we're having fun protecting the universe from these terrorists. And then, obviously, later on, you realize, oh god, they're all sadistic. They're all pricks. Like they're loving this. Yeah. I think you taught me around with two. I'd go for two. You taught me around I'd with go two. For two for Yon Rog. I yeah. I I'd like to I'd like to see him come back. I'd yeah, like to, I'd like to see a bitter Yon Rog return. Stranger things have happened. Uh, because he ain't dead. He's sent he home with dead. his tail between his legs. That was that was like twenty years ago in the MCU timeline. Cool. Make him look older. Cool. But isn't Yon isn't Yon Rog blue in the comics? Yeah, a lot, a lot of Korea blue in the comics. Yeah, I've, 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 him, I've him sort of, like, fuck around with his DNA and sort of, like, try and reawaken an ancient Cree immortal thing. Oh, I mean, fucking hell, Ronin, Ronin. Ronin was kept in, like, a casket thing to prolong his yeah. life. Turquoise Yonrog? Yeah. yeah Alright. Oh! Uh, it's the chase figure. The final villain uh, of Phase 3. Quentin uh, Beck Mysterio. Played by... Yek. I'm going to put him up to a four. Spider-Man No Way Home. Uh, far From Home, sorry. Uh, really, why? Because, similar to the way that Vulture works, but more insidious in the way that he ingratiates himself as a mentor to mm. this kid who wants a mentor, who's desperate for a mentor, because he's grieving the one that he's just lost. Yeah. And how... Um, how well he plays the part mm. of the Mysterio that he sort of created whole cloth. And then when you see that facade drop when he's with the rest of the team, he's completely different. Yeah. And again, and, like Ego, like he, he's trying to win yeah. someone over, but also like Ego, anyone going into the movie who's ever read a comic book or watched a Spider-Man cartoon is going, but he's the villain, yeah. right? Yeah. And even I, by the hour point, yeah. I'm like, maybe they're not doing that this time. Like maybe they're legit not gonna and, make Mysterio you know, a villain. Get, and so when that facade drops and the bar starts to digitally reset into itself and everything, not only does he die, he may die, mm. but he wins. He fucking wins. He wins. And again, as of this recording, we haven't seen No Way Home, but like the effects of his plan, yeah, are carrying on into the next movie. He fucking wins, man. He does win, but posthumously. But yeah. It's there. Plus, um, as as much of a like, we're we're the final like, fuck you, Tony Stark villain of the series yeah. so far. See, so until I was, yeah. yeah. Um, even as that, even as though they're all working together, like fucking eye in the cape, get the creases out the cape, and all that stuff. Yeah, you get those sequences in the theater where they're like testing the drone tech. And he suddenly is like happily just turning the guns on his colleagues and be like, "Are we gonna are we gonna have an argument? Are we gonna have a problem? Yeah, are we gonna have a problem? Like this is someone like Vulture who is willing to murder the rest of them if he he can then still be seen as the guy in charge. Yeah, he's the guy on top. He I wants to win. He wants the celebrity and the recognition for the work he's put in. I think he lacks the. He's also using the framework of the Avengers. Yeah, as a way to humiliate Spider Man yeah. and, and the heroes. Like he's gonna try and kill Fury and yeah. yeah. I think I think the the what well, stops for being mm. a five for me is I think he lacks the sort of everyman uh, part or that you get with Vulture. Like I don't I think he's a he's more of a um, cartoon than than Vulture is. Um, he, he's partly le- he's leaning script, more partly into because of performance. He's leaning more into Justin Hammer. Yeah, territory. Yeah. Than the Killmonger, um, Adrian Toomes kind of. I see where you've come from. But I think it's a great performance. And I think it's a great way that the villain. Uh, I think a lot of the, the really good villains are villains that can manipulate the protagonists in yeah. really interesting ways, and I think he does that, and he wins. He gets Spider-Man to stumble back into an oncoming train. Yeah. Like, that's pretty fucking great. And he fucking outs him. Yeah. Like, after... I, I, <laughs> the one character in the MCU who's like, whose life revolves around having that secret identity, and Mysterio goes, and I'm removing the cloth. Yeah. So, yeah. It's fucking great. He's, I think he's a very strong four. I think he's a four. He's a four. I think he's a four. Um, do we give any points to his team? Uh, no. <laughs> team fuck, Mysterio. Fuck team. Uh, but Janice, she, she straightened out the cape. She got rid of the creases, or whatever her name was. Phase four. 
Yeah, so we only have two from Phase 4 uh, from the films at the moment. And I think this is going to be pretty straightforward for both, really. And I think yeah. it's going to be the opposite thing. Black Widow gives us Drakov, played by Ray Winstone, who is... We debated it, didn't we? We were like, so who's, yeah. who's the villain in Black Widow? It is Drakov. It's not Taskmaster. Taskmaster's cut off, he's the heavy. Yeah, Taskmaster is, again, like, if you're going for the end of the Emperor Darth Vader analogy, Drakov's the Emperor. Taskmaster's Taskmaster, Vader. Taskmaster's not even Vader. Yeah. Taskmaster is the missile pointed at Alderaan. Ta- Taskmaster is the Knights of Ren. No. <laughs> no, because we at least know who Taskmaster is by the end of the movie. Hey, and, like, him. have some investment in their story. Yeah. Um, whereas, whereas, like, you know, Taskmaster's the, Taskmaster's the bullet that kills someone. Taskmaster yeah. is a... Is a a, a, a guard dog pointed at something. I'm going to say... Um, and, and that being visually said, intimidating, very Winter Soldier in, in, in there, trying to keep it vague because this is recent. Uh, still kind of like intimidating yeah. in their methods and, and their execution. Um, but they only really get one scene to properly shine, which is the one on the bridge when mm. we first see them. Whereas Drakov is behind the whole thing. His scheme has literally, both mentally and chemically brainwashed generations of women for his own personal army. Like, that's his whole thing. It's like, I want to keep strangleholds on governments and keep my, like, my finger over the button and let them know it for several places so I can get away with all sorts of shit. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to take... And this is what cemented him as, a, as a, the villain for me. The bit at the end where he's like, I take girls because you're fragile and you are pathetic yeah and no one misses you and it's like you literally see he is sexism as villain he's sexism as villain you see every female as just a fucking as a tool Mm. and i i i commend them for not leaning at all into like to the point where he augments his body in a way that any woman around him will kind of go with his suggestions to a point. Like, they won't do what he says, but they won't hurt him. Mm. They can't hurt him because of something chemical that stops them from doing it. Which is ultimately I, a, a, a a result of his cowardice. Yeah. And, because and, he is a coward. Yeah, which, you know, can make a good villain. Because it leads, mm. you know... Um, pettiness is why Loki's a great villain, for example. Like, it's, it's, you know, negative traits can make them a compelling antagonist and I really and I said this at the time I commend them for not leaning down the Kilgrave route with him mm. like there is there is no implication in Black Widow at all that sex is a part of this in any way he's not a romantic character he no, doesn't no, no, not romantic. He's, not even, he's not a sexual character he's not a sexual character right at all yeah he, ha- he had a daughter so we know he has but has had you know, uh, romance and love and things like that in his but life. Never that but he never of... uses his power yeah. to be like, oh yeah, and in my spare time. Yeah, it's there's, like, there's it... nothing leery or lecherous about him. Which which, which is also almost more chilling. That's more chilling because he, he, he just sees women as a tool. Yeah. Just as a tool for conquest, like, of, of nations, of governments. Yeah. It of actually taking ma- out key people. Like that sort of removal of the sort of animal instincts of him mm. makes him less human in a way. And his 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 complete drive and like just blank perception, black and white perception of like what people are and their functions, leaks into other people. Mm. Like the Red Guardian we meet in the majority of the film is probably not the same dude who would have given his adopted daughters over to no. Drakov no. in the flashback. But that's what hanging around him does. Yeah. Like, the Red Guardian's convinced that, yeah, no, this is good. Like, you'll take care of them. They'll be part of the mission. It'll be brilliant. We'll probably end up working together again at some point. They're great girls. Yeah, no, honestly, they're lovely. They're, lo- they're, they're, they're brilliant. And they'll they'll be incredible soldiers. And later on, of course, he's like, Drakov, screw me over. Oh, I've missed you both. And he's, he started to kind of realise, yeah. fuck, I the, gave the, these girls away to a man who turned them into weapons. The pedestal's been broken. Yeah. In that sense. Um. So I, I don't think he's a one based solely on of his on his effects on, on, and the effect he has on the people around him. Can we push him up to a three, do you think? No. Because, because Goll of Ray Winston <laughs> It's not the best performance. It it's it's <laughs> it's a Malekith, it's a Kaecilius. It's you've taken a really interesting actor. Well he doesn't pop up until the until the end of the movie, and when he does it's It's just 
Ray Winston doing a ropey Russian accent. Yeah. A different And it is a ropey I think, accent. I think a different actor could have pulled something more out of it. God love Ray Winston. God love him. He's great, but I just I think I think it has to be a two for that reason. That's fair. I'm also surprised he's a two. I thought he'd be a one, but the more we've talked about it. I think he's a compelling villain. However, Tony mm. Leung in Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings as, as Wen Zhu, Wu. Wen Wu. Yeah. Um, a- really strong, a- I think. AKA the Mandarin. The Mandarin. Um, um, again, fuck, this is good. He's, he's not, he's not, he's not the, it turns out, the antagonist of the film. He's not the actual threat. But he's the villain. Yeah. And it's, it's that similar thing to Drakov. It's about a, an ego. He, everyone around him has been a means to an end. Yes. To a degree. Like, even his family. Like, he meets the woman of his dreams. He meets the love of his life because he tries to conquer the land she's from. So even even that is like, that's kind of shit. Isn't it? Mm. Like, isn't it weird that the only reason you met is because you were going to do the worst fucking thing imaginable to continue to grow in power this is a man who's lived for hundreds of years because of an alien power source that has prolonged his life well before that he spent the best part of a millennia conquering yeah yeah and and, and the only thing that stops him is because he's like oh she, she's kind of nice he retires she? he retires from it yeah he f- forsakes immortality which almost makes him instantly better than those guys as a villain because we get to see what happens when humanity actually plays a part in his life. But it, it, but it's how he processes his grief that leads him back to it. So in yeah. a way that where... With like he's a true villain because the loss spurs even worse Because it's behaviors. his selfishness. Yeah. It's, it's, it's his inability to accept the loss yeah. and live with his grief that leads him down ultimately back to his old behaviours and, and to, where, make, to make him worse than he was before. Voices whispering in his ear yeah. like lead him to do horrible shit uh, using his tragedy, <clears throat> using what happened to him to that point to get him there. Oh look, he's Darth Vader. And it's a, when it, yeah. when we was a Vader figure, and he's a he's a it, terrifying. It, when, when we've learned more about Vader, he's an Empire Vader yeah. figure. When we've learned more. Yeah. I, 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 he's he's absolutely a terrifying physical threat. Oh, he's horrifying! Close, the... cl- forget his fucking big fight scene and stuff. Yeah, close quarters combat. Yeah, the he's... bit where he's going around intimidating the guys who who who, oh, who, yeah. who, who yeah. ruined his life by taking her away from him. That's horrifying. Like that's really scary. He's just pummeling him into the ground in the restaurant and everything. It's Brainwashes just... his fourteen-year-old son into being. And a this is where the supervillain part comes yeah. in because it's not. Drakov with that cold just curtain where he's like oh no all women mm. are tools and I can turn them into weapons I turn them into guns and I tell them when they pull the trigger Yeah, this is I have followers I have a presence I am a fucking king of my own little world but I'm going to make my son the best version of you mm. lot doesn't give a fuck like, and by the end you sort of his moments again without giving too much away like because it's a relatively recent one his moments of revelation toward the end of the film yeah. are subtle. They're subtle. And you realise he has reg- some regrets. He has some remorse. But he's still kind of a villain right up until the end of the movie. You know what I mean? Like mm. he, He's too driven. He's motivated by love to do the worst things. But he also doesn't see how terrible a father he has been. Like it's all about his wife. It was never about the kids. And, yeah. you know, and, and Jai Ling is a massive example of that. Like she, she's been neglected so much that in her frustration at how she was neglected by her father, she has essentially carved out her attempt at his sort of status for herself. Mm. She's the queen of her own little, like, you know, uh, secret fighting ring empire. She's got people who work for her. She's got enforcers. She's a formidable fighter herself. She has become that which she grew up hating without even realizing it. Yes. Okay. His effects are felt, and okay. she and she will go on to hopefully play with his empire and do something different with it as time goes on. Plempire. 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 I think when we this could change over time because it's a very recent addition, so we might be coloured by having seen it recently. I think he's a five. I think he's a five. If not, a very strong four. 
Because again, Tony Leung's performance is a big part of why it works for me. He's not going to come out on top of the fives, but he is dead. I, I'll put him up there, yeah. Yeah. That might change when we next revisit this in yeah. oh, absolutely. another four or Cause, five years. Because that's but... the thing, Loki and, and others, like we've had time to yeah. look back on them. Now, a tiny little subcategory, we are going to throw them in. There are three villainous figures from the Disney Plus shows which we want to bring in um, to talk about. Because if we can't have our Netflix boys anymore, yeah, then exactly. we're going to talk about the ones that do count, unquote. And these are very much MCU. Yeah. Spoiler alert for the Disney Plus shows. There's your warning. Bum, bum, ba, da, 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 da. Who's now sneaking into the poll? It was Agatha all along. Did it, did it. Catherine Harkness is Agatha. Uh, Catherine Harkness. Catherine Hahn is Agatha Harkness from One Division. Again, the real villain of One Division is Wanda. Yeah. Our antagonistic force who's an issue, who is the villain to fight and is Boo Hiss and absolutely is playing it on the Boo Hiss spectrum. Mm. There are no redeeming features for this character whatsoever. Nope. She is a villain. She doesn't give a fuck about anybody else. She has piggybacked onto Wanda's like horrible act of grief yeah. for her own selfish ends because she's like, I am just, I am curious about you. Like I go around mordoing, I go around sucking Mordo-ing. power from other from other magic users yeah. who have no idea what they're yeah, about. Yeah. I do that, and I I could taste you. Oh my god, I could taste what you're putting out into the world. You smell fucking delicious. But what I walked into wasn't just someone whose magic I can drain. I walked into a fucking delusion. This is weird. You're amazing. I want to watch this play out. Because we get the implication as well that she's sort of dragged into into mm. uh, Westview, but she's got enough of a protective aura around her that she sort of has walked into it and gone, this is fucking weird. Oh, I look different. Okay, I'm going to set up a base of operations. Let's go. And she even like, <laughs> we, have the, we have the use of a resident of Westview. She like breaks one of them. Uh, or I don't even know if he's in... Actually, he is, he is in Westview, isn't he? She breaks someone of Westview out of their spell, so she's got someone to use, yeah. which is Ralph Boner, um, <laughs> a.k.a. Pietro Maximoff, a.k.a. the these movies are a pop culture phenomenon, let's bait and switch the audience character, played by Evan Peters. Um, I love that that turned out to, to, to be of no consequence. I love that yeah. so much. It was it was a great thing. I, why I, did we cast Evan even, Peters? Because we wanted to fuck with you all. That's why. I don't think. I think. I think it was even further exacerbated not by them deliberately fucking with the audience, mm. but by the audience getting themselves worked up into such a fucking froth. Yeah. That they were like, "Oh, it's gonna be Mephisto. Oh, it's gonna be. It's gonna be Multiverse. It's, it's Quicksilver. It's, it's gonna be Magneto." And it just and yet yeah, like, this this series does begin the snowball of the multiverse idea. Yeah. The idea that yeah, Wanda yeah. is using the dark hole to look. For a reality where her kids exist, so it's like that's interesting. Like they 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 use that stuff to fuck with us, just like Agatha Harkness essentially uses the situation to fuck with Wanda. Mm. Like Agatha's not in control of this; she's just watch. She's an interested mm. spectator who's prodding the bear and killing the dog and doing everything she can yeah. to get an interesting reaction out of Wanda so she can then find the crack in the magic and be like, right, I'm going to take your power. This is going to be great. Let's go. I'm going to do- I'm gonna feast off of you. But first, I just want to see what you're going to do because this is weird. This is weird. This is weird. And that, that she firmly slots into the Saturday morning cartoon villain status, which has lost points for some of the other villains so far. But Catherine Hahn's performance is so good. Yeah, it's so entertaining, like it it it's it's Kate Blanchett, Hella kind of like you're just having a fucking ball playing this. Yeah, you are having a ball going for this, um, but for that exact same reason, Agatha ultimately doesn't. She pushes Wanda and she tests her, but she ultimately doesn't change anything. Yeah. Like, she's the catalyst for Wanda realising that she is apparently tied to something more than she ever realised. Like, there is there is a greater plan for Wanda that she's a part of. The Scarlet Witch. Like, there is something out there. 
Yeah. That turns out she's a she's part like it wasn't Ultron or or you know the Mind Stone that unlocked powers in her. Wanda had something in her already. The Mind Stone just yeah. brought it out of her. So Agatha is essentially a stepping stone on the way for another character to take center stage as a villain later. We think Multiverse of Madness out next summer. Um, as a result, I th- I can't put her in the five star category because ultimately she's just she yeah. fu- she fucked around, she found yeah. out, and then she left. Yeah, and and we're gonna see her again. We're gonna see her again. Yeah. Like, it was sort of announced that there's an Agatha Harkness spin-off on the way, and then Catherine Harm was interviewed lately and said, if there is, I've not heard of it, implying that, no, there isn't. No. There but she's, isn't. Possi- she's possibly in talks to reprise the role in another Oh, they'll project. give her around, yeah. If you yeah. can get Catherine Harkness to do some more shit for you, especially as a fun witchy-poo, then yeah. I th- I don't know about you, I think I think of, I think think Comfy 4. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Agatha Harkness. Yeah. Just, um, just, just, if nothing else, for the charisma of Catherine Han and the great sort of reveal... Um, also, this past Halloween at Disney, yeah, uh, at the Disney parks, they did a different villain spots and sections in their parks, where certain villains that don't normally get the spotlight or some new ones mm-hmm. got their chance to kind of shine, have like character interactions, like stages where they were just taunting people at the park and stuff. Oh yeah, which included modern Cruella, fine, um, Sid from Toy Story, fucking inspired. And Agatha Harkness. If you were at a couple of the Disney Brilliant. parks over Halloween, Agatha Harkness Brilliant. was fucking with people. The actors who've played her, there's footage of them online. They are having a ball playing her. Um, they've gone for the full on like ragged dress look, the the like cindered fingertips kind of thing. One of the stages I saw is like the front of a house, there's like a Westview house in one of the areas. It's just like idyllic picture, but it's yeah. cracked up the doorway, and the background is the hex flicking from black and white to red. Yeah. And and she comes out into the doorway and fucks around with people. And it's like, that is really fun. Also, Avengers Campus in Disney's California Adventure, uh, during the Halloween event, people who walked past one of the facades of Avengers Campus would occasionally get jump scared by zombie Captain America mm. shambling out of the door <laughs> and roaring at people. Which is like, that is really neat. Um, Falcon and the Winter Soldier brought us a few antagonists. We have to give an honourable mention to um, Captain America, John Walker, the future yeah. US agent, who is, again, arguably the more memorable villain from the show. Yeah. Uh, I mean, fuck me. Like, not just for the Pixar up memes, but for the near decapitation... Well, for the decapitation with a shield scene is terrifying. Yeah. But the villain is Carly. Is Carly Morgenthau, leader of the Flag Smashers, and bless Erin Kellyman, star in the making. Cannot wait to see where she goes after this. Carly's a one. Yeah, the motivation is never. I don't. I never really fully buy it. I I get it, but she escalates too quickly. Yeah, and it. I, you said this at the time when we were reviewing it. Yeah. I, I on reflection, I'm like, God, you're right. She escalates to full-on terrorist so quickly. And I think it is also a problem of like COVID interfering with the production. Mm-hmm. There being some script changes to cut a pandemic plot from it. Yeah. And things like that. So I think her character suffered from that the most. We also um, don't really get to see her use her super soldier powers against someone of that stature. She never really fights Bucky. No. Like she, 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 she does. She tangles with Bucky and Falcon on the convoy in the second episode. Yeah, but that's that. She's one of many soldiers. She's the one who just comes in and delivers their dramatic kick, get you off the thing. Yeah, like we see her go against Sam. Not to shit on Sam. Sam is a very accomplished fighter. He's he also has the vibranium shield and Wakandan designed Captain America armor. But like, we don't really see Carly as a physical threat shown off, really. We don't get to see her go up against like the roided out John Walker, for example, or yeah, you know, in in a way that would sort of make you go, okay, oh, she's starting to she's starting to lean into this a bit more. She's getting scary. Mm. She's a very she's a sympathetic character until she suddenly isn't. But they still try keep trying to convince you that she is, which in itself muddies the waters of her message, yeah, a bit. Um, you know, Zemo. John Walker, they sort of come away from this having left a bit more of a dent. 
So that's a shame. Uh, Erin Kellyman is great. Cast her in more things. I don't think she could be higher than a one. Fair. Uh, and Sadly. finally, I wasn't sure about this because I was like, Loki's been... What, what if we can't really count anyone? Yes, there's Ultron, but whatever. Um, I can't really... I don't know if, I don't know about Loki. And then you went, no, 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 no. Batman. You said... Mm -hmm. He who remains. Put down Jonathan Majors as he who remains. Because now, he is the one... He is the one pulling all the strings. He's created the TVA. He's created an organisation that kidnaps and brainwashes people living their ordinary lives for no other reason than it is not the, the exact path that he thinks they should be leading their lives. And in doing that, he kidnaps and brainwashes these people into doing his bidding under the auspices of a fictional trio of space lizards <laughs> to then go out and commit mass genocide on entire timelines just to preserve what he believes is the natural order. And yet, okay, multiversal war. Whose word do we have to take that this multiversal war was so bad that this had to be the status quo? The person who created this status quo. And again, he may be... As he, you know, shows to us, he may be honestly the safest and genuinely most well-meaning of all of the, the uh, Nathaniel Richards, Nathan Richards, Kang, mm. Kangs. We'll call not him Nathaniel Kangs Richards. for now. Like he's not. Which which what was his name? It's something Richards, isn't it? No, it's Kang. No, Kang's name is something Richards, though, isn't it? Is it? Oh God. Um, <laughs> we we know that he. I don't think. I we don't know think that the Kangs is, and Richards is We know that he is, he is the least. Um, problematic and uh, most genuinely heroic of all the Kangs. But, he but says, who told us that? He, yeah, he exactly. says that. And yeah, see, when you first said it, I was like, "Right, well, hang on." He, I'm not, I'm not condoning anything he's done to establish the TVA or anything he's allowing the TVA to do under false pretenses of keeping a timeline this and the other. No, no, it is Nathaniel Richards, apparently. But like, he is. When you first said it, I was like, yeah, but hang on. It is a power balance thing of if he gets taken away, shit's going to be ten times worse. And he's seen that. So he knows this is the only way to stop things going horribly off the deep end. Mm. But as you just pointed out, who tells us that? He does. He does. Now, I would then counteract that slightly. We okay. don't know the full extent of this yet. Like, it could be that he is the least worst version of this. And we know that, obviously, we're going to meet a flat-out supervillain version of this character in the form of Kang the Conqueror. Mm -hmm. But Kang the Conqueror is, as this show establishes, one of many versions of this dude. Yeah. And he also, again, like, he gives them the option. He's like, look, you, going forward... It's either you keep this status quo going or you let a worse thing happen, as far as we know, based on what he's told us. He does give Sylvie and Loki the option. Yeah. So. Yeah, okay. It could be that this by this point, he is trapped in a cycle of his own making and has realised, I did the wrong fucking thing, but my thing is not as bad as the thing that will happen if my thing stops. So I think because we don't know the extent of it yet, I couldn't... That's fair. I couldn't rate him too high. That's fair. But I also couldn't rate him too low because fuck me, Jonathan Majors' performance in that last episode of Loki. Jonathan Majors' cheekbones, baby. Jonathan Majors is everything. Mm -hmm. Fucking hell. He's a beautiful, beautiful man. Yeah. But just the charisma, the energy. I'd said it at the time when we reviewed the last episode, but like one of my favourite performances out of all the Disney Plus shows so far outside of like Elizabeth Olsen in one division is is that moment in this where you realize he where you realize retroactively he's reached the end of what he knows is going to happen yeah he's just talking to them and he just kind of stops and the camera lingers and pulls in and lets it just sit on his face for a moment and then very slowly pulls back out to where it was and, it, and on first watch you're just sort of like oh he's a bit weird what's happening he is what's a bit this weird. about he's a bit and then weird. a reflection you're like oh my god that's the moment where him knowing that everything that is going to happen Stops. Yeah. And he suddenly is like, oh my God. And there's this, there's this 
this this fucking collage of excitement and of fear yep. and everything on his face, but ultimately just the wonder of it all. Like, oh my god, for the first time in millennia, I don't know what's gonna happen next. Yep, this is amazing. And and Jonathan Majors fucking slays that moment. Yeah, they're just oh my god, he slays Queen. It slays Queen. Uh, Queen the Conqueror. He <laughs> in the multiverse there is a Jonathan Majors with boobs. And I'm a happy man with that. Um, I literally just mean Jonathan Majors with boobs. They could be on him. They could be part of him. They could be in a bag next to him. I don't know. I just I feel like it'd be a fun time. No, 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 no. I'd I'd question the provenance of them if they were in a bag next to him. Um, he who remains. But we put him then. I think he's a three. All right. I think he's a nice, strong, happy, healthy three. And he could go either way, depending on what we get yet to see from him. Yes, exactly. Like because we're like, gonna see more of it. Like with like with Agatha and a few others, yeah. And like like Zemo, there is room for this to change. So as it stands, uh, as it stands, as we it have stands. five, five out of fives. So we're now we just put them into a top into a numbered list into a top five. I would say that is the best way to do it. I don't think any is necessarily better than the other because they all scored the same. But we could always decide who we kind of just enjoy more uh, as a personal preference. So we've got. Loki, Tom yep. Hiddleston, Adrian Toomes, played by Michael Keaton, yep. Witcher, uh, Eric Killmonger, played by uh, Michael B. Jordan, Black Panther, Thanos, played by Josh Brolin from all the fucking films Thanos is in, yep. and Wen Wu, played by Tony Leung from Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. I now, can give you a list right now. Oh fuck, hit me. So go from five to one. From five to one, uh, Wen Wu. Okay. Loki. Okay. Uh, Thanos. Yeah. Vulture. Yeah. And Killmonger. Okay. Mm, that's a, do you know what? Yeah. That's that's a, that, all right. That's my top five. Okay. In that order. Okay. Okay. From five to one. Okay. When we only below Loki, because we've got less of him, and Loki's a bit more fleshed out. Yeah. Uh, Loki below Thanos because he redeems himself which d- make, doesn't make him a worse character but it makes him it, it makes him a better character but a worse villain yeah Thanos also he's answered to Thanos yeah he's a big answer, portion of Loki's Thanos. villain story is as Thanos, Thanos is lackey uh, Thanos below the other two because he's less grounded and that's it really okay um, Vulture below uh, Killmonger because he's more selfish Mm-hmm. And Killmonger at the top because he is of all the villains, he is the one who has the best point. He just has the absolute wrongest way of going about it. Okay, that's that's where I am. All right, mine's not too dissimilar because we want? have the same five people to work from. Yeah, obviously. Um, for me, five is Wen Wu. Yeah, same reason. Just we, you know, if there was more of him, he'd probably go higher. Yeah. Um, but Tony Leung's performance is fucking fantastic. And, yeah, and really fantastic. I also love that one of our top five, like, it's, it just looks like a guy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The others dress up or, or, or like, just tech themselves up. Whereas when we're obviously he's wielding, With ten magic rings. wielding an alien fucking weapon, but it's just, it, it, he just looks like a man. And yeah. that, that to me is already kind of interesting. A man's man. As far as like, up against these other five, you're like, okay, that's interesting. It looks um, like the right man's. Uh, number four, Adrian Toomes, Vulture. Yo, Ke- Adrian! Favourite thing about it is Keaton's performance. Yeah. Um, yeah and fair, and fair, second favourite thing is big scary wings flying in and being... Like, the music working with him. Yeah, he is. And being like, yeah. oh my god, that thing is horrible. Like, the Vulture isn't... Some writers have made him scary in the comics. Yeah. But he's not a scary villain. He's just an interesting visually... A visually interesting villain who you can have fun with, for the most part. Yeah. In this... He's fucking scary. It's a, it's a hell of a silhouette. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Or a silhouette. Oh, the, the, the goggles and the little fucking yeah, LED readout yeah. with like little beady eyes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Third is Too Loki. Right. Third is Loki. Okay. He's definitely earned his stripes and he's the most recurring kind of okay. villain within the series. But, um, All right. and that's one thing that just me as a consumer of comic book movies always wanted. I wanted some recurring villains. Yes. Because for years that wasn't a thing. It was an unwritten rule that they the baddie dies off. in each film and, and I, I always hated that. So Bad rule. Loki Bad finally rule. gave me what I wanted. Um, Killmonger is number two. Yeah. Uh, credible performance. Intimidating as fuck. Two really iconic looks in the film as well. Yeah. Like both his Vegeta costume and <laughs> and his, uh, his gold and Black Panther armour with the big blades. Yeah. Like... Um, 
plays really well off of other villains. I like I like a villain who plays well off of the side villains yeah, too. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, I call it I call it the Sheer Khan technique. Ah! When you play off the other other villains quite well, because him and Ulysses Claw have some great scenes together. Yeah. Um, the personal stakes with T'Challa are there. The fact that they they only really learn he T'Challa our hero only really learns his personal connection to Killmonger at the last minute. Really, yeah. Like yeah. and then just has to deal with it. Is is sort of you know you know the effects are going to be felt for a long time after that day. Yeah. Um. And and you know also just again that f- that final bit of dialogue, the delivery and the way it's framed. Ryan Coogler directed the shit out of that film. He did. He did. Um. And if Nakia isn't the next Black Panther, then they're making a mistake. Um. Well, we'll see more. And Thanos is number one because Thanos gave me what I wanted. A big throbbing hard on. A yeah. <laughs> Big pair, of testes, big pair of testes on a face. No, um, Thanos gave me... Oh, he's me... a bald chinian. Yeah, he's a big old bald chinian. Put his scarf back up over his chin. <laughs> Thanos gave me what I wanted for years as a fan of these movies, which was a recurring villain who doesn't doesn't outstay their welcome, is used effectively, and also... He has a long build-up, hasn't he? He's yeah. got a long build-up, and he... Uh, uh, and he... You know, he's got an arsehole big enough to accommodate Ant-Man, and he... <laughs> He brought out, he brought out the best in the heroes. I think that's another factor that you don't get with your one-off villains. The villains that stick around longer get to challenge the heroes longer, which in turn shows their faults and their their um, perfections and their imperfections and their yeah. strengths even better. Yeah. You know, Spider-Man versus the Green Goblin's fun, but Spider-Man versus the Green Goblin in a dance that's been going for a decade is even more compelling. Thanos brought out the best in Tony, the best in Steve, the best in Nat, the best in Thor in particular. Those four really go through the fucking ringer. Um, he, he draws out, like, tragedy, uh, uh, an investment from us through what happens to Gamora, through what happens to Nebula... Like, he's just... Him being who he is and affecting that world... Yeah. Gives me more of what I love of everything else in that world. And a good villain compliments the hero. And Thanos compliments a fucking fleet of them. Yeah. And just for that, he kind of pips it for me just ever so slightly. As as a fan of comic books as a medium. Killmonger, very close second. But, like... You know, like Killmonger getting the entire Avengers and the Guardians of the Galaxy and all the Wizards of Kamataj and everybody to come up against him. Do you know what I mean? And well, that, that's... who is Christopher? Well, that's a question for you, hey! fuckers. Hey! Out of that top five, what's your ranking? Loki, Wenwu, The Vulture, Killmonger and Thanos. Where does it stand who, for you? Who has a different top five? Do you have a completely different one? Do you think this is a lot of bullshit? Have you got to the end of this and gone... Fucking Marvel shills. Are then you... tell us, why is Steppenwolf version one the are greatest... You an... <laughs> are you annoyed that we're not talking about Doctor Who? Probably. We mentioned Chris Eccleston and David Tennant. So there you go. You got mentions. That's all you're getting, really. That's all you're getting, motherfuckers. And that's all um, you're getting for this week. Yeah, so... There's a lot of it. We'll so catch shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. As far as filler episodes go, it's fucking f- as full as a taco, you yeah. little shits. Right. Mm, mm. Double booked. What? This man's got shopping to do. Uh, I've got a, other things. I've got a spot on my chin to pop, which is really annoying me. Uh, we'll yeah, catch you soon. Oh, Look at you're it. You're going to get it. you got to get it. I don't want to shave, because if I shave, then I'll cut it open. Oh. Um, cut it open. Drain it. <laughs> oh, Jesus Drain Christ. Drain it, and then clean it. Big damn contact at gmail.com. Leave comments on the YouTube channel, Big Damn Channel. You can follow us on Twitter at Big Damn Cast. And of course, if you sponsor the show on Patreon.com slash Big Damn Cast, then you're helping us keep the lights on. And if more people we get Patreon in, the more extras we'll start to put out. It's 2022, bitch. Soon, probably. We'll see you all very soon. Till then, uh, stay frosty. Are you implying that 2022 might not happen? Well, none of this ever happened, really. This entire two and a half hours was a dream. Huh. Now go get your fucking shine boxes. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>